Hello, and welcome to the Brave Traveler podcast for fans of the supernatural, tales of fantasy, and adventure. My name is Dave Murray. I'm an author, screenwriter, and former Disney animation artist. The story I'm going to share with you actually started as a bedtime story for my kids and turned into an epic adventure novel which many find entertaining and remains controversial to this day. The story is fiction. I talk about monsters and magic and spiritual warfare. Demonic forces that come to steal children and the angels sent to protect them. What's not to like? Aside from demonic forces coming to steal children. Before I get started, if you like this content, please subscribe and kindly give me a thumbs up. Feel free to share it with others. Makes a nice, cheap gift for the holidays. Having said that, welcome brave traveler and relax as the story unfolds and our adventure begins. Majesty, the Sorcerer and the Saint Episode 1, Chapter 1, Something in the Closet The goblin's job was simple, keep an eye on the child. It was only a human child and a little girl at that. How hard could it be? But this was no ordinary child, for she had a guardian and that made all the difference in the world. Nothing unusual ever happened in Summerport. It was a quiet little town, with pleasant sunsets, white Victorian houses, and front porch swings. Normally the weather was quiet as well, but the rumbling of thunder over distant hills was a sign of things to come. The old weather vane atop the Campbell house pointed due west and hardly moved in spite of the strong gust of wind that blew through the trees. A weather vane that resisted the weather was a peculiar sight, but not as peculiar as the horrible little thing that sat atop the roof of the Campbell home. The tiny gray creature rested its lumpy back against the cold steel and looked up with yellow eyes as an icy rain began to fall. The pointy-horned imp hated the light of the earthly realm, and even this gloomy half-light was more than it could bear. The grim urchin was barely twelve inches tall and grumbled as the rain drizzled down its bony face. Then, with a shudder and a chill, it quickly disappeared from view to set about its dark purpose. The house itself looked drab and dreary, nothing like it did years before. Back when there was the laughter of children and the white-haired old woman with her worn-out old Bible used to pray. It was then that a light surrounded the quiet little home, a pure golden light that shone like a beacon from heaven. Of course, no one ever saw the light or even knew it was there. Yet, from the chimney to the basement, the front door to the back fence, the Campbell house glowed like a lantern, and by night it grew even brighter. But now that the old woman was gone, and no one prayed for the children any more, a living darkness had descended on the home, and all that was needed was a willing heart for the watchful creatures to set their dark plan in motion. The boy sat in his room and glared at the sheet of paper. He had said the strange words over and over again, countless times, and still nothing had happened. What good is a magic spell if you can't use it? Jack sneered and stood to his feet. It's not like I didn't try, he yelled at the empty space around him. Then, with hands trembling and his face twisted into a snarl, he gripped the piece of paper and tore it right down the middle. Jack gathered the two halves together and ripped it again and again, and when he was done, he tossed it into the air. The bits of paper drifted down like snow, but before they could settle, Jack whirled around and kicked his chair. He shoved his desk and knocked over his lamp which shattered the bulb with a pop. He staggered and stumbled and tore through his room, kicking books and boxes and piles of clothes like so much trash. When he was done, the room resembled a garbage heap, which didn't look much different since it was already a mess when he started. Still, he felt better about himself and stood in the center of the room, with his chest heaving up and down. But before he could catch his breath, he thought he saw something. In the dim stillness, something moved. Jack leaned forward and peered at one of the tiny pieces of paper on the floor. He blinked and rubbed his eyes as the thing stirred then leapt up and flitted back and forth 
like a moth trying to find the light. He looked here and there as every fragment of paper, every shred down to the tiniest speck, came to life. They hopped over things, swirling around in a sudden flurry. There was no wind or even the slightest hint of a breeze, as Jack stared in disbelief and the bits of paper fit themselves back together without the slightest care that the boy was watching them perform their magical task. In a matter of seconds, the old sheet of paper was back and rested itself on the floor as though nothing unusual had happened. Jack reached down, with hands trembling, and picked it up. He flipped it over several times to check the front and back, but aside from its yellowed, tattered edges, there was no sign of damage or the slightest tear. Jack suddenly stiffened, as though he sensed another presence somewhere nearby. Then, with the paper in hand, he turned to face the closet that lingered in the shadows across the room. He stared at it reluctantly and regarded it with a new found respect. The closet was where he had found the old sheet of parchment, and it was from behind that door that he knew its powers had come. Okay, I'll do it, he said. I don't know how, but I'll try. Jack whispered softly, a dark and solemn oath he would never forget. Katie Campbell watched the rain streaming down her window. Drawing her knees up in front of her, she listened to the distant thunder as the storm came and showed no signs of letting up. Dad would be late, but even with the weather to contend with, the window seat was lined with pillows and she was comfortable. She leaned her head against the cold window frame and wished her teeth could have been more comfortable too, if not a little straighter. Moving her tongue against her braces, it had only been a few days and the soreness was finally going away. But that wasn't the worst of it. At thirteen she hated the way they made her look. She hated all the jokes and all the ribbing. But here, alone in the stillness of her room, she was as beautiful as she wanted to be, and that felt good. I have learned to be content in whatever situation I find myself. Katie smiled as she remembered what her nana used to call her pearls of wisdom. They were words from the Bible which the old woman used to read to them when she and Jack were little. Now, in the quiet moments, Katie missed her dearly. Ever since Grammy Nana had passed away, things were very different. Katie couldn't say how. They just were. Even when she wasn't thinking about it, she could feel it. And sitting there, alone in her room, she could feel it now, with the rain trickling down and the steady patter against the glass. She listened for a while until she heard another sound, a peculiar knocking. At first, she thought it was the wind or a branch outside rapping against the shutters, then turned to see her brother Jack standing in the doorway of her room. At sixteen he had grown considerably and was a tall, thin scarecrow of a figure lurking in the shadows. Katie watched him for a moment and was about to say come in when she realized he wasn't looking at her at all. Instead, he was tapping on her open door very lightly and inspecting it with great care, as though it contained the knowledge of ancient secrets that were his to find if only he knew what to look for. After a great deal of frowning and nodding, Jack finally stood back, took a deep breath, rubbed his hands together, as he had done so many times before, and started to chant. Digahoo, bigahoo, bala, Boogia, Jack said in a low voice, much deeper than his own, like he was pretending to be someone else. When nothing happened, he began to say the words faster and louder. The silly-sounding words made Katie giggle. Quiet, Jack said, and continued to chant. Digahoo, bigahoo, bala, Boogia, he repeated the words with greater insistence, as though he wanted the door to do something. Digahoo, bigahoo, bala, Boogia, he shouted flicking his fingers at the door like he was counting by tens, when Katie finally interrupted. What are you doing? Jack dropped his hands by his sides and stared in defeat. He had done this to every single door in the house, and each time it was the same. 
I'm trying to cast a traveling spell on your door, but it won't work, he said, with a look of disgust. Oh, Katie said, and tried not to sound totally disinterested. She didn't really understand why Jack felt her door should have a traveling spell, and didn't think her door particularly needed to go anywhere, but since she was thirteen and Jack was her older brother, if he was willing to waste his time, she was willing to watch. Jack pulled a sheet of paper from his back pocket. I don't get it, he said. I wanted a transformation spell so I could do stuff, you know, like turn pennies into gold, and they send me this traveling spell that doesn't even work. They? Katie asked. Jack ignored her and stared at the piece of parchment. At the top of the page, in very fancy writing, were the words, Gelzuin's Sorcery and Wizard's House of Magic. Just below was Jack's name, next to the words, Traveling Spell. The magic words were clearly written in the middle of the page. At the bottom were the instructions that told you how to perform the spell. They were written in Old English. Jack made a funny face as he looked at the words for the umpteenth time and read them aloud. Set ye door at the nor world's sliver of a splinter's eye to ye dwelling place, then rest ye brow at the spot. Jack paused, then shouted, What on earth does that mean? Why don't you pretend to be something else? Katie asked. Being a wizard doesn't look like very much fun. Oh, what do you know? Jack huffed. He didn't like it when his little sister talked to him like he was the baby. Katie spun around to look out the window and saw Dad's car pull into the driveway. She jumped up and ran past her brother, who just stared at the sheet of paper, pondering the riddle in his hands. Dad's home! Katie shouted and dashed out the door. Now that the show was over, as far as Katie was concerned, Jack would have to figure it out on his own. Downstairs there was a frantic jumbling of keys at the front door, and a fair amount of fumbling at the doorknob. When the door finally swung open, Dad stumbled in and looked as though he had just walked through a car wash. He stood there in sopping clothes, with briefcase in hand, and tried to maintain some sense of dignity as he adjusted the package tucked under his arm, then cleared his throat and forced a smile. Honey, the garage door, he called out with the rain still dripping down his face, but before he could finish, a voice called back from somewhere in the house. I turned it off. It was a sweet voice that was obviously busy at the moment. Dad frowned at the answer and the lack of any reasonable explanation. And why would you do that? he asked, trying not to sound too upset, since an open garage door, or at least one that was switched on, would have saved him the aggravation of running all the way from the side of the house to the front of the house in the pouring rain and getting his clothes soaking wet. The table, sweetheart, remember? The pert little voice called back with a cheerful and happy note, as though it all somehow made perfect sense. Oh, of course, Dad said, even though he had absolutely no idea what a table had to do with a garage door that wouldn't open. But since he was already wet and dripping on the carpet, he decided to surrender all logic to the little woman who was always right and meant well. It was then that he heard someone coming. Katie was moving fast, bounding down the stairs, and before Dad could move, she hit the ground running and jumped into his arms. It was an open field tackle that made him drop everything to catch her. Katie squealed as she hugged him and clung to his neck like a trained monkey. Dad stumbled back, pushing the door closed behind him. All right, all right, I give up, he chuckled. When Katie finally looked, she giggled and pointed at his hair, which was wet from the rain and stuck out in weird places. What? Dad said, pretending not to know what was wrong, which only made him look even sillier. Did you get it? What did you bring me? Katie asked, grinning from ear to ear. I'm happy to see you too, Dad smiled. This was hardly the normal reception, but then tonight was special. Dad glanced down and Katie's eyes lit up. On the floor was his briefcase and the package slightly dented from the fall. <laughs>
It was wrapped in crinkled paper, neatly taped at all the corners, and marked Express Mail. Katie jumped down and tore through the postal package like a crazed animal. When she was done, she held the brightly colored box out in front of her and gasped, You got it! A Dynaflo Rainbow Flyer Kite! Just the one I wanted! Thank you! Can it really do tricks? If you're good enough, it's got the dual handles and control lines, Dad said. Katie gazed down at the picture of the kite in its shiny new box, her mind soaring with dreams of the toy she could hardly wait to fly. Thank you, she shouted. Well, you got an A, and a promise is a promise, Dad said, then backed away to hang up his coat and nearly bumped into Mom on her way by. Mom was a small, slender woman who had managed to keep her figure and her sanity while raising three children. Coming through, she said, with oven mitts and a steaming hot bowl of chicken fried rice. I bought the antique table for the study. It's in the garage. I didn't want you to hit it. How was your day? Wash your hands. It's time to eat, Mom said, and was gone before Dad could even open his mouth. He smiled, then picked up his briefcase and set it beside the door. Seated in the dining room just down the hall, perched atop her high chair, was baby Sophia, tossing sugar-frosted crunchies everywhere. At eleven months old, this was great sport. Hey, Fia, how's my little chubby bubble? Dad said and waved. The baby was too busy looking for more cereal to empty onto the floor and couldn't be bothered with cute nicknames at the moment. Oh, Sophie, Katie said, then shook her head as she went to help her sister. Hey, Jack! Dad yelled upstairs just in time to get a glimpse of the boy going back to his room with his face buried in the sheet of paper. He mumbled something that was more of a muffled grunt than a word. Still, the message was clear. Whatever, I can't be bothered, was the gist of it. And with that, he slammed his bedroom door behind him. Dad turned to Mom, who was on her way back to the kitchen. Tonight is the night we settle this, Dad said with a look. Mom answered with a reluctant smile. I'm ready when you are. This was a terrible start for a wizard's apprentice, and Jack knew it. He sat on his bed with the paper in hand and stared at his closet as he thought back, back to when he first heard the voice. It was four months ago to the day, right after Grammy's funeral, and he had been seated in the very same spot. The voice had only spoken to him once, the voice of a man that whispered two words, Two words that still echoed in his mind. Vaulted verses. When he first heard it, they meant nothing and made no sense. But the more he thought about it, the more mysterious and magical the words became. He said them over and over again, and when he could think of nothing else, he knew there would be no rest until he found out what they meant. That's when he began to study. After searching the internet, Jack brought home books, stacks and stacks of books, and devoted himself to learning everything he could about wizards and magic. The more he read, the more he wanted to know. He read about the elder arts of sorcery and spellbinding. The book spoke of ancient mysteries, legends, and hidden powers, but nowhere, nowhere did it mention the two words he was searching for. He thought he had looked everywhere, until one day when his mother had finally given him the dreaded task of cleaning his room, starting with his closet, which then looked more like a cave. The closet door was swung wide open and had not been closed for months due to neglect and the overflow of tangled objects heaped in front of it. Jack waded into the mountain of debris that had been gathered there. At first it looked as though he might be gobbled up by the clutter of clothes and old toys, shoes, boots, forgotten objects from his past, down to empty soda cans and candy wrappers. He dug his way through, complaining all the while, flinging things here and there as he went. The more he dug, the more there seemed to be. I'm going to need a shovel, he thought. And when he was completely inside the closet with clothes dangling all around him like vines in a jungle, something caught his eye. It was a glint of metal in the shadows. 
He moved a few more things aside, and there, shoved against the wall at the back of his closet, was a silver chest, the size of a shoebox. Kneeling there, he stared at the thing with great curiosity, then brought it into the light to get a better look. The little chest was finely polished with a swirling silver pattern carved into its surface. Jack tried to think if he had ever seen the silver box before, but knew it was highly unlikely, since he would have remembered such a thing. Then how did it get there, he wondered. Surely no one in his family would have hidden it in his closet. After much thought, Jack knew there was only one explanation. The silver chest was obviously not of this world and had magically appeared by itself. As a newly self-appointed wizard's apprentice, he was sure of it. He settled down in front of the mysterious box and smiled, pleased with the explanation, even though he knew it was fantastic and impossible. There was a silver latch on the front of the chest, which Jack slid open easily. Then, when he was ready, he placed his hands on either side of the box and lifted the lid. The inside of the chest was lined with red velvet and contained nothing more than an old yellowed piece of paper, which he carefully unfolded. On it was a message, handwritten in large letters that looked like some sort of spell. How in the world, Jack thought to himself, and was suddenly a little more suspicious about his discovery since the spell seemed to support the idea that the box was indeed magical. He glanced around to make sure he was quite alone, and when he had regained his nerve, he read the instructions more slowly. He read them again, and when he was sure he knew what to do, he placed the note back in the box and set it in the closet. After a great deal of effort, he cleared away all the junk, then closed the closet door, stood back, and said the magic words, Sumelkim Otkaf. A second later he thought he heard something, a flutter of wings on the other side of the door. He reached for the doorknob, then remembered that the instructions specifically said to keep the door shut until dawn. As curious as he was, he decided to wait. The next day Jack opened the door very slowly, half expecting something to fly out, but aside from the usual clutter, everything seemed normal. The silver box was right where he had left it. Jack pulled it out, and when he opened the lid, he found the same piece of paper. At first he thought nothing had happened, until he unfolded the old piece of parchment and was amazed to find something else written on it. In addition to the magic spell were four new words, How are you today? They were written in the same perfect handwriting. Jack scrambled to find a pencil, cleared off a space on his desk, and wrote very carefully the letters F-I-N-E, fine. It was a simple response. With that, he folded the paper, placed it back in the silver box, said the magic words, and closed the closet door. Again he heard the fluttering sound and stared at the door, but dared not open it for fear of breaking the spell or even worse, letting whatever was inside get out. The following day, when Jack opened the door, he looked inside the silver chest, and to his surprise, the old words were gone and had been magically replaced by new words. The note simply said, Very good. Is there something I can do for you? Jack could hardly contain himself. He wrote back, Who are you? then put the silver chest back in the closet, said the magic words, and listened. He heard the flapping sound which slowly faded away, as though there was a great space on the other side of the door that led far beyond the walls of his closet. The next day Jack took everything out of his closet, which impressed his parents greatly. Now that's what I call house cleaning, Dad exclaimed. When the closet was perfectly empty, Jack stood inside and looked around. It was a small space, only five feet wide and six feet deep. He knocked and banged on the plaster walls, which were bare and obviously quite solid. When he was satisfied that there were no secret openings or hidden passageways, he scratched his head, then read the note inside the silver chest. He was surprised to find that they were the same words he had written the day before, Who are you? 
He wondered if he had forgotten to say the magic words. Then standing there, he decided that if he was going to send the letter back, there was a much better question he wanted to ask. He erased the first message and wrote, What are the vaulted verses? All things considered, it seemed to be a logical question. After all, if the box was really magical, sent by magical means, one would think that whoever sent it should know the answer to the question, since it was indeed a question of magic. At least it was worth a try, Jack thought. He put the box back in the closet, closed the door, and said the magic words. There was the usual flutter of wings, and the note was on its way. The question was, where to? Majesty, the Sorcerer and the Saint Episode 2, Chapter 1, Something in the Closet The following day, Jack opened the silver chest and found the same words on the note. Again there was no response. He erased the words with some concern and wrote, Hello, are you there? Then put the note back and closed the closet door. He said the magic words, then heard the usual bird-like noises coming from within. This time he was more concerned about the message, and hoped there would be an answer. The next day, he was surprised to find a new message. It read, How about a nice traveling spell? Jack was so overjoyed he held on to the note for the whole day, and read it every chance he got. Then, when he was really able to give it some thought, it occurred to him that he didn't know what a traveling spell was, and honestly had no interest in one. In fact, if he had his choice, he knew exactly what kind of spell he wanted. He wrote back, I'd like a transformation spell, please. He folded the paper, placed the note back in the box, then closed the door. As usual, he said the magic words, Sumelkim Otkaf, but what he did next even surprised himself. Jack quickly grabbed the doorknob, gave it a twist, and flung the door wide open. Inside, floating near the floor, just above the silver chest with a piece of parchment in its grasp, was a tiny creature, a little man, eight inches tall 
as shiny as metal and as black as coal. It had the bony face of a cat and shielded itself from the light with leathery black wings. The thing whipped its tail and glared at Jack with eyes red as fire, then hissed like a snake and dove into the misty darkness of another world. Jack watched as the back wall of the closet returned and the mist faded, then took a step back and slammed the closet door in horror. It was several days before Jack found the courage to move his bookshelf and furniture away from in front of the closet. When he did, he was armed with a flashlight, his baseball bat, and wearing his catcher's mask. With the closet door swung open and his bat held ready, he looked around to make sure the little monster was nowhere in sight. When he was sure it was gone, he found the silver chest and read the new message written on the piece of paper. It said, The creature is my servant. It's afraid of the light. Don't do that again. Now, how about a nice traveling spell? The voice of reason whispered, Turn back now. But it was only a vague warning, drowned out by burning curiosity and a desire to know what secrets lay within the shrouded world beyond his closet door. Then, without any concern of the dangers involved, Jack scribbled the words, A traveling spell would be fine. Moving carefully and cautiously, he put the silver box back in the closet, closed the door, and said the magic words. Jack shuddered when he heard the thing inside flutter away, and again the horrible creature had come and gone. Since most servants usually stay with their master, Jack was at least relieved to know that the thing didn't actually live in his closet. The following day he received just what he asked for, a genuine traveling spell fit for a wizard. This particular kind of spell was to be cast upon a door. He had managed to figure out that much but nothing else, and there were no further messages. That had been nearly three weeks ago. Jack sat there staring at his closet, contemplating the mystery of it all, when another thought popped into his mind. It was like an alarm had suddenly gone off in his head. He jumped up and looked around. Something's wrong, Jack thought. Wizard's intuition! That's it! He had read about it and even tried to practice it a little, and now that it actually seemed to be working, he found the sensation rather thrilling, until it occurred to him that if it really was working it meant that there really was something wrong and he needed to be worried instead of excited. He felt an urgent need to leave, to get out of the house, but before he could finish the thought there was a knock at the door. Jack! Dinner! Mom said and peeked her head inside the room. Wash your hands before you come downstairs, she added, taking in the total chaos that was his room, then closed the door. Now what? Jack bit his lip and paced back and forth. He thought about climbing out the window, but it was still raining and a two-story drop down to the bushes below would break more than his fall. He tried to calm himself and stared at the door. Whether or not it was Wizard's intuition, he absolutely didn't want to leave the safety of his room and wished there was something he could do, something that could help him. What he didn't know was that something was already there and had been watching him the whole time. Jack sat at the dinner table dressed in black, black t-shirt, black pants, black socks, and black combat boots. As usual, the clothes made a definite statement. Jack was never prepared to say what that statement was exactly, but it was clear that his clothes had become a kind of uniform. He was also the only one at the table with black hair. Everyone else had hair that was brown and rested on their head in a normal fashion, while Jack's hair stood straight up. Aside from that, and the earring which Mom and Dad were thankful was in Jack's ear and not somewhere else, Jack looked relatively normal. Mom and Dad smiled at each other and tried not to stare. Katie said grace and blessed the food, while Sophie sat in her high chair and provided plenty of entertainment. 
She pounded her spoon in protest, and as dinner progressed, she squished handfuls of creamy vegetables between her fingers and plastered gobs of it on her face. Very good, Mom said when the baby managed to actually get some in her mouth. Katie laughed at the mess she was making, while Jack winced and did his best not to look. The conversation was light. There was talk of the day's activities, what Dad had done at work, the antique table Mom had found at the store, Katie's kite, and the A on her English test. Jack watched them all suspiciously and waited. Just then, Sophie stopped wrestling with her food long enough to point at Jack with her sloppy spoon and laugh. She laughed so hard she chuckled and snorted like a little pig, then suddenly looked Jack straight in the eye, which made his hair stand up even straighter. It was as though she knew what was happening, and that no amount of magic or wizardry could possibly save him. Jack glared back at her, then looked around the table. Whatever was going to happen, he would just have to sit still and write it out. Then, in the middle of a second helping, Dad made the announcement. Well, I've got something to tell you, he said. What is it? Katie asked excitedly. Jack looked at Katie from the corner of his eye. It was all he could do to keep from reaching out and putting his hand over her mouth. Is it the picnic? Is it? she said and could hardly sit still. Jack frowned at the thought. Don't be silly. This is about me, not some stupid picnic. Maybe, Dad said, then smiled and leaned forward to look at Katie with a raised eyebrow. How did you know? Katie jumped out of her chair. I knew it! I knew it! she yelled. Tomorrow is Saturday, and it's going to be warm and sunny. It'll probably be the last good day of the year. Can we have the picnic tomorrow? Please, it'll be great, I promise. Last good day of the year, huh? What do you think, honey? Dad said. Mom nodded as though it might not be a bad idea. I guess so, she said. You could even try out your new kite, unless of course you've got other plans. Dad suddenly looked surprised and disappointed. You don't have other plans, do you? Katie smirked, then grinned at the question, while Jack just stared. That was it? All this worrying for nothing? So much for wizard's intuition, he thought, and breathed a sigh of relief, then finally relaxed as they talked. Now that dinner was over, all he had to do was wait to be excused. Jack sat with his chin propped in his hand and looked away at the blue lamp with a pink shade on a table near the door. The lamp was a rich dark blue, the perfect color for a wizard's robe. The pink glow of the lampshade reminded Jack of what was commonly known as wizard's fire, the glow that came from a wizard's hand when he successfully cast a spell, which was something Jack had not yet managed to do, nor had any other human since the days of Merlin. Jack, Dad said for the third time. The boy jumped and was a little annoyed that he had to come back to their boring conversation. What? Jack said. The picnic? Dad asked as though Jack should have an opinion, since they had been talking about it for the last five minutes. Oh, yeah. Cool, Jack said, sounding totally disinterested, and just nodded while Dad stared at him and frowned. The moment of truth had come and Jack had hardly noticed. There was a rather lengthy pause, during which time Dad looked at Mom. Mom smiled at Dad, and Dad nodded. Mom nodded back, and Dad raised an eyebrow, to which Mom shrugged and frowned back at him. Jack looked back and forth at the two of them like he was watching a tennis match, but since this wasn't nearly as much fun, he pushed his chair back and promptly asked to be excused. Wait, Dad said. Mom and Dad suddenly looked frantic, blinking and nodding back and forth at each other, this time with a little more English and topspin. Katie had never seen her parents act so strangely. They snarled and grumbled like two spoiled children fighting to get their way. Mom? Dad? Katie said, but her parents only ignored her. You, no you, no you, no you! is all they said with their blinking eyes, jerking heads, and twitching lips.
Although they had both agreed that the time had come to talk to the boy about everything, the books, his fascination with magic, and all the weird behavior in general, neither one could bring themselves to even say a word. The two were hopelessly engaged in a grueling contest of face-making and head-jerking with no end in sight. And so, with that, Jack simply left the table, plodded upstairs, and retreated back to his room. When he was gone, Mom and Dad stared at each other dumbfounded, like partners in a doubles match who had just watched an ace go right down the middle. You! Dad said, pleading with his arms outstretched. Me? I thought you! Mom said in her own defense. The two were terribly confused, and although neither one could even begin to explain what had happened, there was in fact a very good explanation. But since it involved unseen creatures with supernatural powers that had invaded their home to steal their children, neither one of them had a clue. While Mom and Dad were still glaring at each other, the baby sat in her high chair perfectly still with food on her face and her eyes fixed on the ceiling. The infant hardly blinked. Her gaze was so intense Katie looked up as well, but saw nothing. The baby stared unafraid at the tiny demonic creature floating near the ceiling, peering down at them from its non-existent perch. The mischievous spirit was no bigger than a wrinkled old shoe and looked just as pitiful. It sat with its arms drawn up in front of it, with eyes as black as polished marbles. It was this wicked little imp that had brought fear and confusion and helped Jack to escape. Now that its job was done, it no longer paid attention to Katie's mom and dad. Its eyes were fixed on the children. The devilish creature was afraid and nearly trembled but not because it was unveiled and could clearly be seen by the infant, but because the imp absolutely hated children that glowed. The thin layer of light that covered Katie and her sister radiated from their bodies and shone brightly through their clothes. The creature peered at the light and slowly backed away, for every minion of darkness knew that any child that glowed was a child of God and that meant there was a guardian nearby. When the imp had seen enough, it wasted no time and quickly turned aside as though it had been called away, then dove through the wall to escape. Once it was gone, Sophie thrust her spoon at the ceiling, flicking bits of food into the air, then turned to Katie, wide-eyed, and yelled, Daba! Which meant, Did you see that? The baby stared at her, waiting for a response. But Katie just got goosebumps instead and shivered. Chapter 2 What's So Big About Magic? Jack rushed to his room, then closed the door behind him and breathed a sigh of relief. It was a narrow escape, and he smiled to himself, totally unaware that he was still being watched. Without a sound, a dozen little creatures crept through the walls like living shadows, invisible monsters, black-hearted imps, and pointy-horned urchins. They hunched under withered wings and gathered around the demonic little creature that had returned from the dining room. It saw me! It saw me! The tiny imp squeaked and trembled as it chattered out nervously, when a tired and reluctant voice moaned from the shadows. Who saw you? The little one and the child, they glowed, they glowed. We dare not leave this chamber, or it will find us, the imp cried out. The demonic spirits huddled together under the watchful gaze of their leader, the only one who didn't seem the slightest bit worried, a green-eyed, hook-nosed goblin that stood three and a half feet tall. The goblin Numlock sat atop Jack's bookshelf in plain view, looking as defiant as ever and glared at the boy as Jack went about his business. He hated this place and the task he had been given. In short, the goblin hated humans and was not afraid to say so. Humans! Bah! he snarled through pointed yellow teeth. The imps and urchins stopped their seething long enough to listen. What are you afraid of? These bottomless barrels? Bags of bones? <laughs> 
Worthless wonks, the lot of them. No magic in them. No magic at all. What good are they? The goblin snarled. The imp fluttered up on bat-like wings and cried out, But the guardian! The guardian! He screeched. Hang the guardian! shouted Numlock and swiped at the tiny imp. The creature quickly darted back into the shadows, panting in fear. Numlock turned his back and rubbed his stubby beard as he observed the boy. Jack was chanting again, sitting cross-legged on his bed, and happened to be flicking his fingers at something on the floor. Numlock groaned and could barely be bothered. He climbed down off the shelf and made his way across the room. There was so much junk scattered around, the goblin didn't know what Jack was looking at, or even what he was trying to do. Amidst the clutter was an old book. It was worn with a tattered cover, and Numlock guessed that was it. Since it was his job to encourage the boy and keep him happy, the invisible goblin reached down and gave the book a gentle tap. The book barely moved, but Jack's eyes lit up in utter amazement, even though it was not the focus of his attention. The truth was, he was trying to move the object next to the book, an old baseball with ragged stitching that was brown with age. But when the book moved instead, Jack focused all of his efforts on that. He hopped off his bed, lit a candle, and hunkered down over the book in the flickering light, then strained as hard as he could to use his magic powers. But it was hopeless. Numlock had done his duty, and the book would not move again. The goblin watched the boy with growing resentment, and thought back on the events that had led up to him being sent here. It was still fresh in his evil mind, like it was only yesterday. Numlock growled at the memory. The order had come from Marplot, great high sorcerer of the wizard's grand council, and the most powerful wizard of the Nor world. At two thousand nine hundred and forty-three years of age, Marplot was also the oldest wizard in the Nor world, and quite a pathetic sight. He was so thin and worn, his long gray beard weighed nearly more than he did. Too frail to walk, the feeble old wizard floated from place to place like a ghost in his grand council chair, with his little goblin servants chasing after him wherever he went. Still no wizard dared challenge Marplot, for his power was too great. When his eyes failed and Marplot was blind, he trained his hands to see and used his magic to read the ancient scrolls by mere touch. Although the doddering old wizard was nothing to look at, he was really quite famous. It was widely known that when Marplot was a young wizard and had risen to power, he conspired with demons and joined in a plan to wage war against God. In that day the battlefield was earth. The Son of God had dared to become mortal and stood before man, alone and without his angels. The wizards and demons joined forces and used their powers to turn the minds of men against the Lord of Glory. And when they had put the Savior to death, Satan and his demons rejoiced to see the Son of God betrayed by men and hung on a cross. But the battle was not yet won. Marplot was only one soldier in the army of darkness, but still he remembered the day the angel came down from heaven and stood atop the empty tomb to proclaim that he who once was dead was now alive forevermore and had saved all mankind from certain destruction. The angel's words were like a hammer that smashed the gates of hell and declared the glory of God. When the victory was won and the Son of God was seated upon the throne, Satan and his demons were defeated, and the wizards of the Nor world were all made to look like fools. That was over two thousand years ago, and Marplot could not forget the past which haunted him. He toiled in bitter envy, seeking revenge, but he would have to wait upon the Lord. He would have to wait until Christ's return. The problem was, no one knew the day or the time. Marplot searched his books on sorcery and went through his entire library. He searched the writings of the early mystics, 
writings on ancient history. He even searched the holy scriptures, which was a difficult thing for a wizard to do. To a sorcerer, the word of God was like a dagger in the flesh. But Marplot would bear any pain to learn the secret of the Lord's return. Try as he might, the answer was nowhere to be found. In truth, it was a secret that God kept well hidden, which made Marplot all the more determined to find it. He did, however, manage to stumble across something fascinating. The Holy Scriptures mentioned the word children nearly two thousand times. It seemed that God had a special interest in children, and that alone was enough to make Marplot suspicious. Why was God so concerned with children, he wondered? Did they know something about God no one else did? If so, perhaps one of them held the answer to the secret he was searching for. Century after century, he studied the minds of children and discovered they did indeed hold special knowledge. He also discovered that the knowledge faded with time, which he felt had something to do with innocence that went away as children grew older. Over the years Marplot learned many things from the children. For instance, he learned that God loved daisies more than any other flower. That's why there were so many of them. He learned that your smile was connected to your heart. If you had a good smile, you had a good heart. If you had an evil smile, you had an evil heart. And anyone with a good smile and an evil heart was truly wicked and would be found out eventually. But since Marplot had no smile at all, he chose to ignore that information entirely. One child knew that dogs could see angels and barked because angels were so bright and shiny. What that had to do with God, the wizard didn't know. There was a lot of this kind of information which Marplot considered useless. But every once in a while, he came across a child who knew something truly interesting. For instance, one child knew that angels could indeed be tempted. The wizard made note of that. Another child knew that goodness was stronger than evil. Marplot disagreed, but made a note of that as well. Then there was the infant that smiled all the time. Her parents called her a happy baby. The truth was, the infant remembered heaven and could still see it clearly from the comfort of her crib. Her parents never suspected. Another child knew that every single person believed in God even if they didn't care to admit it. This kind of information was interesting, but hardly what Marplot was looking for. Then there was the rare instance when he came across a child with really incredible knowledge, things that were truly astounding. These children were one in a billion. Marplot remembered the little five-month-old baby who knew exactly what the throne of God looked like and what it was made of. A hundred years later, there was an eight-month-old infant who knew why God made the universe so big. The baby understood it with perfect clarity, but the matter was simply beyond the wizard's ability to grasp. Fifty years later, he came across a child who knew the purpose of dreams, which the wizard found very interesting. Marplot had to wait another 135 years before he met the child who actually came close to the knowledge he was seeking. It was a little boy who was only two years old, and he knew why God was going to judge the world. The problem was he didn't know when. Still, Marplot was encouraged by the information and kept searching. He continued to search the minds of children for another 457 years without so much as one piece of interesting information. Then one eventful day, the wizard Marplot came across a peculiar little girl. At four years of age, this child knew the names of the Twelve Apostles and could recite the Ten Commandments. Admittedly, this information was readily available to anyone with a Bible. But this child knew such facts about God at an age when most children were more concerned with games and toys. This caused the wizard to look more closely, and when he did, he shouted, Katie Campbell! The feeble old wizard announced to the Grand Council in his quivering voice. I have found you at last, he yelled. She is the one. <laughs> 
She knows the way. Find her, and you will find Majesty. Of course, at the time no one knew who or what Majesty was, until Marplot explained. This is the key, he croaked from underneath his matted beard. The horse of power and glory will bring him back to reign over all the kingdoms of all the worlds. Find the horse, and we will have power over heaven itself. We can stop the Lord's return. The girl was considerably older now, and since her innocence was slipping away, there was a fair amount of debate as to what to do next. There was talk of sending an army of ogres to quickly fetch the child, but the council decided on a more subtle approach, since an army of ogres walking the earth would attract more attention than they needed. Not to mention, the child would most likely be guarded by an angel. With that in mind, the Grand Wizard set about the task of studying the girl to learn everything they could about her. Most felt it was all useless, really. The little girl was far too old. At thirteen years of age, what little knowledge of God left inside of her was less than a glint in her mind and fading fast. Indeed, they would have to move quickly if they were to get anything out of her at all. But even this was a delicate matter. The knowledge of God was a very dangerous thing, and getting it would not be easy. Like a serpent trying to avoid the sharp quills of a porcupine, it called for great skill and cunning. They found it peculiar that such a special child should be born to average people like Scott and Elaine Campbell. Two powerless humans with no particular interest in God or his kingdom. But it wasn't until they discovered the boy that they considered his curious mind and were able to devise a plan. For the most part they argued about the best way to use the boy, and what sort of trap to lay for his sister. Then they argued about the wrath of God to come as a result of it all, and spent a great deal of time on that. That's when Numlock's master stepped forward and offered a suggestion. Perhaps it would be better for all if the child came to us, he said. The council approved the idea and placed the matter entirely in his hands. And thus, before Numlock knew it, he had been thrust out of his world and sent to Jack's room, with the instructions to stay there until the job was done. And here he was, loathing every minute. When Numlock looked at the boy, he was sitting on the floor staring at the book in a sulk. The goblin wagged his head then growled and turned away. It was time for him to see where the girl was. The imps and urchins watched the goblin cross the room, then shrank back when he passed through Jack's door like a vapor and ventured into the hall. Numlock leapt into the air and crouched on the upstairs banister like an ugly cat. He glanced around nervously, then raised his head and sniffed. There was an essence of something, a fragrance in the air that he recognized. Yuck. The guardian was nearby and he could smell him. He hated his master for making him do all the hard work, and hated him even more for putting him in such a perilous position. Still, guardian or no, he would stand his ground and do his job. His fiendish green eyes peered downstairs as he watched the child of God. Katie was all aglow as she hugged her mom and dad. They kissed her golden face and spoke to her with soft, reassuring voices, filled with love and caring. It was all too sickeningly sweet for the goblin to bear. And when the little girl turned and started up the steps toward him, Numlock glared at her in surprise, rounded in horror, and retreated back to Jack's room. Once inside, he poked his ghostly green head through the door to see where the child would go. Katie walked to her room calmly and quietly, a little unnerved by the strange occurrences at dinner, and when she opened her door, 
Numlock pulled back, shielding his eyes from the blinding light coming from within it. The goblin squinted, jerking his head this way and that, struggling to see the child as she entered the room without any care for the pure white light that was suddenly beaming all around her. So bright was the unearthly radiance, it seemed to engulf her form completely as she slowly and gently closed the door behind her. When the hall was darkened once more, Numlock blinked till his eyes could adjust, and when he could see again, he staggered into the hall, gripped his dagger, and growled. For the light that came from within Katie's room could only have been made by one thing, a ministering spirit, a defender of the throne, an angel of God. Numlock sneered and knew he had found the guardian. Hello, and welcome back to the Brave Traveler podcast. We're fans of the supernatural, tales of fantasy and adventure. I'm your host, Dave Murray, and the author of Majesty, the Sorcerer, and the Saint. I think I mentioned that Majesty started out as a request for a bedtime story from my two boys. As a writer, I took the challenge seriously and told them if they went to sleep, I would think of something really great. Note to parents, that only works for two or three nights. After that, they get, like, angry villagers with pitchforks, you know. Where's the story? No story, no peace. <laughs> Fortunately, I had what my old English teacher used to call a germ of an idea. The next four nights, I told them a story that had everything. Wizards, magic, fairies, goblins, ogres, angels and demons. They were riveted. Granted, they were only seven and four and were happy to just be up past bedtime. Still, that was my spark of inspiration. Uh, later, I'll tell you one of my son's contributions to the story that was pretty amazing. And uh, I'll also tell you some responses to the book you won't believe. Anyway, once again, if you like this content, please do all the fun things people who like fun things are known to do. Hug a friend, get an ice cream, subscribe, comment, hit the like button. All right, with that, let's get back to the story. Majesty, the Sorcerer and the Saint Episode 3, Chapter 2 What's so big about magic? Katie's room was nicely decorated and brightly colored. There were dolls and cute stuffed animals on her bed and on either side of her dresser and bedside table. It was all very neat and pleasant with the exception of the invisible seven-foot angel standing in the middle of her room, radiating light like the sun. The angel floated off the ground and took up so much space, his head scraped the ceiling while his wings were open wide and barely fit inside her room. His silver eyes were aglow, as was his entire body. This angelic being with his perfect features and tall frame was lovely to look at. But if Katie could have seen this warrior of God draped in white robes smiling down on her, she would have been absolutely startled out of her wits. The fact that he was a protector of the innocent, sent by God to keep her far from evil, would have brought little comfort, especially with a host of imps, urchins, and a hook-nosed goblin living in the room just down the hall. Katie took her seat by the window, and the angel turned to watch her his wings casting silvery sparks as they swept through the walls, and he gazed down upon the child. He could feel her emotions stirring. The strange goings-on at the dinner table had left Katie feeling unsettled and out of sorts, and the more she thought about it, the more it disturbed her. Then there was her brother, who was acting stranger than usual, and this upset her as well. She had to admit she was having a lot of thoughts lately that were upsetting, then remembered something her nana used to say. When trouble starts to come your way, wait to worry and start to pray. Wait to worry and start to pray. More pearls of wisdom, Katie whispered, then climbed down off the window seat and got down on her knees. She folded her hands and bowed her head, then closed her eyes. The towering angel knelt down beside her, 
and folded his giant wings. The only official prayer Katie knew was the Lord's Prayer and the 23rd Psalm. Aside from that, she usually just talked to God and told Him what was on her mind. Katie had to think a moment, and when she was ready, she spoke softly with a tenderness in her voice that was both sweet and respectful. It was a simple prayer from the heart of a child that made the angel smile. Then, with a polite amen, she hopped to her feet. Katie tended to keep her prayers short and to the point, since she figured that God was busy and had far more important things to do. Still, she was so confident in the power of prayer, she simply had to go see if Jack was any different. The angel rose quickly to get out of her way and watched her march to the door. When she reached Jack's room, she peeked inside. It was darker than usual. Her first thought was, Maybe I should have prayed for Jack's room instead. Katie knocked and wished she hadn't. It was a weak little knock that tried not to attract attention to itself. Across the room, she could see Jack hunched over his large play table that was shoved in the corner. The boy glanced over his shoulder, then turned back around, which was the usual greeting. She wouldn't have minded a bit if Jack had actually gotten up and helped her across the room, but knew that was far too much to hope for. The room was watching her, and she could feel it. She stiffened slightly and tried to find the courage to tell the room to go mind its own business, but it was hard enough just walking across the darkened floor, littered with clothes and other things she could hardly make out. The ugly goblin glared down at her from on top of Jack's bookshelf. Katie could feel his icy gaze as she passed by and looked around her. The moment she took her eyes off the floor, she tripped and stumbled, then paused to see where she was going. When she did, the devilish imps slowly crept out of the dark to surround her like a pack of invisible wolves. They gloated with hungry eyes and licked their pointy horns with long black tongues that curled out of their mouths like shiny ribbons. Red claws clicked and glinted in the dark as they threatened to devour her delicious innocence. The fiendish creatures were still churning with hideous delight and wicked pleasure when the huge angel walked in behind Katie and filled the room with his light. The blinding light with its angelic power was the last thing the little monsters ever expected to see in Jack's room. With a shriek and a howl, evil scattered in every direction, like cold water splashing out of a hot pan. It jumped into books and ducked inside boxes. Imps and urchins darted back and forth, bumping into each other, then dove through the walls like terrified shadows. The light hit Numlock so hard it knocked him off his perch atop the bookshelf and sent him crashing to the floor. One look at the guardian, and the goblin scrambled to his feet as quick as he could, then lunged head first and slid under a pile of clothes where he waited and trembled. The evil creatures made lots of noise, fleeing for cover in their frightful attempt to escape, but none of it, not one bit, made the slightest sound to the human ear. Nor did Katie or Jack see the radiant light of the angel. The room was just as dark as ever. But with evil in hiding and the invisible angel towering over her, Katie felt much better. She crossed the room and came up behind Jack. In front of him was what used to be his train set. Now a medieval landscape took up the entire surface of the table, miniature and perfect to the slightest detail. There were hills with miniature trees and bushes, and a little stone castle wonderfully constructed in the middle of it all. Below it was a stream of real water that flowed under a narrow stone bridge that Jack had made. The pump was well hidden, and the water streamed around tiny rocks that looked like boulders next to the castle. In the dim blue light of his desk lamp that shone like a silvery moon, it all looked quite real. The castle was called Bathenoir, a name Jack had found in a book. Bathenoir meant refuge, which seemed to fit since he spent so much of his time sitting there dreaming about magic and fighting magic battles. Below the stone bridge 
was the Black Knight, with grim mace held high. He was trapped by a dragon perched on a ledge just above. The monstrous beast was poised, reared back on its hind legs with wings spread apart and huge jaws gaping wide. The Black Knight's armor would offer little protection. One blast of the dragon's fiery breath, and the dark warrior would be reduced to ashes. Katie peered over Jack's shoulder with some interest, but all she saw were toys. The knight was a little plastic figure painted black. The dragon was twelve inches long, made of rubber with cloth wings. Katie watched as Jack reached across ever so slowly and moved a little bronze figure into position behind the dragon. The bronze figure was that of a tiny wizard that was no bigger than a chess piece and finely polished. Then, with his thumb and forefinger, he grasped it and prepared to make his move when Katie asked, What are you doing? Jack cringed. The question affected him as always, like fingernails on a chalkboard. He paused and spoke slowly, never looking away from his toys. I'm about to cast a spell, he whispered. Katie just stared. By the looks of things, her prayers had not been answered, but since she had already come this far and managed to brave the cruel darkness of Jack's room, she decided she might as well see what she could do on her own. So what's so big about magic? None of it's real, you know, Katie said. Jack winced again and tried to speak as calmly as he knew how. Why don't you just go back to your room? Okay, kid? He said smugly, just to show her who was boss. And there's no such thing as wizards either, Katie added. Jack finally turned on her and glared. What do you know? You're just a girl, Jack said, jeering at her. Katie shrugged, determined to make her point. I know that wizards and dragons don't even exist, and magic isn't real. It's all just a bunch of phony tricks, she said sounding very sure of herself. Oh, yeah? And I suppose that God and his cutesy little angels are all that stuff you read in the Bible is supposed to be real, huh? Of course. Everybody knows that. Jack rubbed his hand across his face. That's it, he said, then grabbed his sister by the arm. He walked across the room with Katie stumbling and bumbling along behind him, and when they had reached the hall, he placed her outside, then slammed the door in her face and locked it. Thinking that was that, Jack turned around and stood toe to toe with a supernatural being that could have easily flattened his house without so much as a thought. The seven-foot angel that he had referred to as Cutesy. The glowing guardian glared down at Jack with fiery eyes that had seen the defeat of the Persian army and the fall of the Roman Empire. He sneered at the boy's rude behavior, then looked away and stormed out of the room, taking his light with him. As soon as the angel was gone, Numlock crept out from under the pile of clothes to see if the coast was clear. Jack had already gone back to his table, when the rest of the devilish creatures slowly came out of hiding, they looked around rather sheepishly at first, then began to elbow each other and nod their approval as one of the creatures came forward. He did it! He sent it away! This one will do well in our world! The devilish minion and urchins clapped and cheered for the human boy, but Numlock remained unimpressed and his eyes turned cold. This one will never survive in our world. It is the child of God they want. This boy is only human, the goblin sneered. Outside of Jack's room was a sign on his door that read, Keep Out. Another sign, scribbled in red marker, was exactly the perfect height for Katie to read, and shouted its message loud and clear, No Babies Allowed. Katie just pouted at it. Katie, are you all right? Mom called up from downstairs. Yeah, Mom. I'm okay, Katie said with a sigh. This was not the first time she'd found herself in the hallway outside of Jack's room, standing there, thinking 
her prayers had not worked out the way she wanted them to. Then it came to her, a thought that was more of a question, and standing there in the hallway it was begging to be answered. What does Jack like more than anything in the whole world? That's easy, she told herself. He likes magic. She remembered how Jack would go on and on, whether she wanted to hear it or not, about every mythical creature imaginable. He talked about fairies that could see into your heart. He talked about dwarves that could build anything as fast as you could think of it, or ogres that were too stupid to build anything at all. He said that ogres were mean and big as bulls, that they carried tree-stump clubs, rusted axes, and wandered through the woods without enough sense to get out of the rain. You'd be mean, too, if you were that stupid, was Jack's conclusion. Her next thought was directed to herself. What do I like as much as Jack likes magic? It was a good question, and the answer came to her as quick as a flash. I like God. She didn't know as much about God as Jack knew about magic, but that was okay. The thought of God and his angels made her just as happy. And that's when it occurred to her. Jack wasn't happy at all, not in her opinion. She couldn't even remember the last time she saw him smile. Perhaps that was the answer. Jack knew everything about magic, but as far as she could tell, it didn't make him happy. In fact, lately he was looking pale and sick with worry. The more she thought about it, the more obvious it became. If Jack was going to get better, something had to be done. Katie looked up at her brother's door with her invisible angel standing behind her, taking up a ridiculous amount of space in the hallway. God is more important than magic, you'll see, she declared, then turned and plodded back to her room with the idea that somehow she would make Jack understand whatever it took. By the time she climbed into bed, she was feeling much better about everything, and with her head nestled on her pillow, she closed her eyes and promptly went to sleep. The angel stood at the center of her room once more. His presence made it a stronghold, a pillar of strength against evil, and the boundaries had been set in place. Even Jack had only been able to get as far as the door and no further. Still, Katie's words had issued a challenge that would lead her into danger, and as her guardian, the angel knew he could only do so much to protect her, for he had no authority over free will and in such matters could not interfere. Standing there, he could feel the powers of darkness growing beyond the walls, and even in the world around him. The angel looked down on the child, for now she was safe in her room. Then with one last glance around him, the guardian disappeared into a speck of light and was gone. Chapter 3 The Chase by nine o'clock Saturday morning, the family was packed in their little gold van and on their way. They drove through quiet neighborhoods, where people mowed their lawns, trimmed the hedges, and read their papers on shaded porches. Along the way, a baby pointed from its stroller, while a dog barked and ran circles in its yard, and a curious flock of birds gathered overhead attracted by the supernatural being that was gliding just above the treetops. Aside from that, the guardian angel went completely unnoticed as he followed the van below him. Soon they were driving along narrow roads, winding through the hills of Summerport. The ride through the countryside was relatively peaceful, all except for Jack's grumblings, which were typical for any ride that lasted longer than ten minutes and involved having to sit next to his sister who, at the moment, happened to be staring at him as though he were on a shelf in a museum. "'What's the matter with you?' Jack said, obviously annoyed. Katie just smiled and wondered when she should tell Jack about God. But, judging by the look on his face, she could tell that now was not the time. Jack's anger continued to prowl around inside of him, and the presence of the angel above only made matters worse. 
An hour later, they arrived at the campgrounds, early enough to find a perfect spot overlooking the bay. Dad spread their blanket in the shade of a big oak tree, while Katie unpacked the picnic basket. When all was done, and Mom and the baby were settled, he put Katie's kite together. Hardly able to control herself, she watched as he showed her how to hold the control handles and use the guidelines to make it do tricks. Then, just like that, he handed it over. Okay now, wait for the wind, he said. With a gust and a pull of a string, Katie watched in amazement as the kite leapt into the air, winding its way upward as though it suddenly had a life of its own. That's it, Pumpkin. You're doing great. <laughs> You're on your own. Sure you can handle it? Uh-huh, Katie said, gazing up at the kite, trying to control it with a jerk of her shoulder and her tongue curled at the side of her mouth. Jack, however, was not as impressed. He followed Dad with his head down and hands jammed in his pockets as they headed to the paddle boats. Meanwhile, Mom chose a quiet moment to settle into her lawn chair and read a book in the shade of the tree. After a while, she looked over at Sophie, who was sitting on the blanket surrounded by toys and staring up with the most peculiar expression. The infant watched the man, who stood just beyond the blanket, glistening like a shiny new coin, draped in white robes with his giant wings folded against his back. The angel stood there, quietly watching Katie as the kite soared high above and seemed perfectly content right where he was, until the baby pointed at him and yelled, Tapa! Mom looked up at the invisible angel standing right in front of her and smiled up at the sky. Yes, sweetheart, kite! she said with a pleasant smile, and went back to her book. The angel looked at the woman and the infant, then glanced around. There were other babies on other picnic blankets, staring and pointing. There was even a cocker spaniel, yapping noisily. But the dog fell silent and shied away when the guardian spread his enormous wings and rose silently into the sky, higher and higher until he was so far above the park, he was little more than a speck. From there he could watch Katie just as well and not attract any attention. Dozens of kites sailed above the windy hilltop. Some were larger and went higher. Some had long fancy tails that twirled like windmills, while others looked like caterpillars dancing on the air. But none of them were as colorful as Katie's and could do fancy tricks. She didn't mind showing off a little, and even made her kite fly sideways, which impressed others nearby. Whoa! They were sure Katie was some kind of expert, that is, until she pointed her kite straight down, pulled back as hard as she could, and plowed the nose of the kite straight into the ground like a dart. Time for a break. She dropped the control handles and walked away with her head held high as though she had meant to do it. When Dad returned with Jack, it was time to eat, and there was plenty of food. There was chicken and salad, fries and burgers, but even with a full stomach on a beautiful sunny day, Jack could think of nothing else but the traveling spell that wouldn't work. Can we go home now? he whined. Nope, Dad said, and pat the boy on the back as though it were a good try, then handed him dessert. Mom's cherry cheesecake with strawberries and whipped cream swirled on top. Even Jack couldn't resist that. After lunch, Dad rubbed his hands together and grinned. How about we do some fishing, he said, with a wink, and grabbed the poles. Jack gave a weak smile as though it were absolutely the last thing he wanted to do. With the sun high in the sky and another slice of dessert, Katie laid down for a nap and fell asleep next to the baby. When she awoke, hours had passed, and the setting sun peeked through the tall, shady pines across the lake. She sat up, rubbing her eyes, and Mom looked up from her book. I was beginning to think we were going to have to carry you to the car, she said. Katie looked around to see other families leaving as well. Time to go already? she asked. 
and took a nice long stretch. Mom placed a bookmark in the page where she was. Come on, help me clean up, she said, and started clearing off the blanket. Katie grabbed a few things and happened to notice the title of the book and said it slowly. The Exploration of Revelation. Mom glanced down at the book that was between them. Oh, it's one of Nana's old books. I found it in the attic, she said. What's it about? Katie asked. Well, she paused. It seemed to be a tough question. It's all about the last book in the Bible, called Revelation. What does it say? Well, it says a lot of things, like it talks about Christ and his return. He's called the king, and um, it says he rides a beautiful white horse. Mom mentioned other bits of information that were interesting as she gathered the baby and the toys around her, but it was the image of the white horse that stuck with Katie. She smiled to herself as she tried to picture the animal and wanted to know more about the story, but the park was closing, Jack was grumpier than ever, and it was time to go. Ten minutes later they had piled everything back into the van, picnic basket, chairs and all, and were headed home. Katie gazed out the window as they left the park behind, and thought about what her mom had said. Mostly she thought about the white horse, and when she closed her eyes, she could almost see it in her mind, glistening in golden rays of sunlight. What an amazing animal! Certainly the most beautiful creature anywhere in the whole universe, if it really existed, she thought to herself. A moment later, another thought occurred to her that made her smile. I wonder where the white horse is right now. I bet it's guarded by angels in heaven. The White Horse and the Wonders of Heaven. Too bad Jack couldn't think about things like that. Katie smiled at the vision, then happened to open her eyes, and stared in sheer amazement. One second later she would have missed it. Across the way, in a wide-open pasture, was a white horse, as grand and wonderful as anything Katie could imagine. Stop! Stop! Katie yelled so loud, Dad pulled over and slammed on the brakes which woke her brother who had drifted off in the back seat. Katie wasted no time and scrambled out of the car with her mother close behind. What is it? What, what happened? Jack rubbed his eyes, trying to sit up. When he saw it was only a horse and not something really interesting like a dragon or an ogre, he grumbled and went back to sleep. Katie and her mom crossed the quiet country road and went right up to the big white fence that surrounded the pasture. They stayed perfectly still as the wind rustled through the trees and the tall grass around them. The horse stood at a distance, grazing with its long white mane gently flowing. The animal was graceful and at the same time filled with power. Katie held on to her mom's arm as she watched the white horse and giggled with excitement. When she did, the animal looked up. It looked right at them and Katie held her breath. The horse took a few curious steps in their direction. For a moment it seemed that it might actually come all the way up to them. It paused, gleaming in the golden sunlight, then turned and bolted away, its hooves thundering across the field. When it finally disappeared over the hillside, Katie clapped. She yelped for joy, then hugged her mother. I saw him, Mom! We saw him! That was great! Mom smiled and laughed and enjoyed the excitement, then looked down at Katie seriously for a moment. Honey, you do know that's not the horse from the story, right? Katie smiled and felt a little silly. I know, she said, and had to remind herself that it really wasn't. It had all happened so quickly. First the story about a white horse, and then to actually see one. Mom had to admit it was quite a coincidence. When they returned to the car, Katie peered out the window. What do you think his name is? she said. Who? Dad asked. The white horse, Katie replied eagerly. Dad thought aloud as he started the van. Oh, I don't know. Lightning? Trigger? Katie stared out the window as the van pulled off. No, that sounds too made up, she said. 
Dad frowned and decided to keep his opinions to himself as he turned his attention back to the road. Katie looked behind them, hoping to get one last glimpse of the white horse. I think I'll call him Snowball, she said. Dad glanced at Katie in the mirror, then looked at Mom with a smirk. Snowball, he whispered. Good name for a rabbit. Bye, Snowball, Katie said, as they drove away, and the big green pasture disappeared among the trees. The experience had been nothing less than enchanting. The picnic was everything Katie expected, and the surprise of the white horse was a gift she would never forget. Jack, on the other hand, was miserable and hadn't gotten much sleep since Katie wouldn't stop talking about the horse for the entire ride home. It was dark when they pulled into the driveway. Katie got the baby as Mom and Dad unpacked the car. And while everyone else was busy helping, Jack climbed out of the van and marched into the house like a grumpy old man who couldn't be bothered. The angels stood at the door and watched the boy as he slumped past. After dinner, Jack still wore a frown, and the fact that Katie was in a good mood didn't help matters at all. When it was time for bed, she was still beaming a smile and should have known better, but couldn't help herself. She skipped down the hall to Jack's room, threw the door wide open, and went straight inside. Numlock and the little winged creatures dove for cover as the child with her golden glow went straight to Jack who was seated at his table, pretending not to notice her, until she rushed up behind him and gave him a big hug. Hey, what's the matter with you? he shouted, then pushed her away and jumped to his feet. When he turned around, Katie was standing there, beaming a smile in her fleecy flannel nightgown and pink bunny slippers. I just came to say good night, Katie said cheerfully. Look, kid, just because you saw some stupid horse doesn't mean you can get all mushy on me, he said, doing his best to be mean and utterly pig-headed. Wasn't he wonderful? Katie said, staring off dreamily. It was like God just put him there, in the perfect place, just so we could see him. What do you mean, we? Jack said, and turned his back on her. The castle Bathenoir and its stone bridge lay in front of him, and Jack was in the middle of another game. If you think I care about some stupid horse, you're cracked, he said. Jack placed the bronze wizard under the stone bridge gently and muttered to himself as he settled back into his chair and considered the dragon's next move. The monster would surely follow him into the dark, and when he did, Katie peeked over Jack's shoulder and tried to be polite. What's the matter? Didn't you? Jack rounded on her with fists clenched and eyes glaring. Can't you see I'm trying to do something here? I saw your dumb horse, okay, and I don't care. I don't care about your stupid fairy tales or your baby stories. None of it matters to me. Now quit bothering me, all right? When Katie opened her mouth to speak, Jack yelled even louder. Did you hear me? I said, go away! He turned and pretended she was gone, just to make it perfectly clear. Katie hung her head and walked away. Just ahead of her, standing in the doorway, was the seven-foot angel, shining like the headlight of a freight train and glaring straight at Jack. This was the second time the angel had witnessed the boy's ill-mannered behavior. Katie paused and stood in front of her invisible guardian. Tomorrow is church, she reminded Jack, but the boy just stayed hunched over the table with his back to her. Good night, Katie said with a whimper. Again, there was no response. But before Katie could leave, Dad came storming into the room and walked right through the angel, which parted like a vapor. He pushed his way past Katie and went straight for Jack. Dad had heard everything from downstairs, and after Jack's rude behavior and selfish attitude all day long, the boy was in big, big trouble. Katie turned away and sulked back to her room with the angel close behind while Dad's voice echoed down the hall as he yelled at Jack and scolded him for being so mean. When Katie climbed into bed, the angel took his position in the middle of the room while Katie stared at the ceiling and listened. 
Jack was really getting an earful now, and she could hear him pleading. But, but she, but she was... From the sound of things, he wasn't making a very good case. After a while, it got quiet, and Katie listened for any sound at all. A moment later, there was a knock at the door. She sat up, surprised to see Dad standing in the doorway. Katie, Jack's got something he'd like to say to you, he said with a stern voice, then reached over and pulled Jack into view. He held the boy by the back of his collar, which made Jack look like a stiff-necked puppet. He looked at Katie with a nasty scowl on his face and his lips drawn tight. As Katie watched, his mouth twitched and wiggled as though something was struggling to get out. Then, sorry, he said and winced like the word had thorns. Dad released him, and Jack walked away, grumbling and filled with resentment. Then, all at once, Dad lowered his head and sighed. He looked tired and worn. This wasn't the way I wanted the day to end, he said. Katie forced a smile. It's all right. I'm okay. Dad leaned into the room a little. I love you, Pumpkin. Sweet dreams, he whispered, and blew her a kiss. When he went to close the door, he remembered that Katie liked it open, then pushed it halfway, smiled once more, and left. The hallway light went out, and Katie laid back in bed. The angel could feel her sadness, but knew there was no excuse for the boy's bad behavior. With Katie safely tucked in, he took one last look around the room, smiled at the little child of God, then vanished in the moonlight. As usual, Katie said her prayers. She prayed for her mom and dad, she prayed for her little sister, but most of all, she prayed for Jack. Like all her prayers, it was short and sweet. She prayed that God would not be angry with Jack and that he would help her brother to forget about magic. She felt like she was praying for a miracle and had no earthly idea that she was about to get one. With that, Katie rolled over and snuggled her cheek against the pillow, and just before she closed her eyes, she happened to glance at the door. When she did, she smiled. The door reminded her of the silly words Jack had said over and over again when he had tried to cast his spell. She remembered the words because they made such a funny rhyme. In fact, it sounded so silly she couldn't resist, and said the words softly so that they barely whispered from her lips. Digahoo, bigahoo, bala, bukia. She smirked at the ridiculous-sounding words, and doubted they were even words at all. Then, in the perfect stillness, she looked at her bedroom door, which was halfway open, exactly the way her dad had left it. In the dark, the door was pointed straight at her and had become a thin line, so that all she could see was the edge of the door and the knobs on either side. When she moved her head one way, she could begin to see more of the front. When she moved her head the other way, she could see more of the back. Katie decided to play a little game and see if she could look at the door so neither the front or the back was visible, which would make the edge look the thinnest. With her head on the pillow, she moved ever so slightly until it looked the thinnest it possibly could. And just when she thought she must be looking right at the precise and exact edge of her door, there was an instant flash, like a burst of sunlight that filled the room for a split second and was gone. Katie sprang up in bed and sat there in the darkness, staring and blinking. She held her breath and rubbed her eyes then tried to stay perfectly still, wondering what had happened and where the flash of light had come from. Perhaps a car had gone by, or maybe lightning. No, she thought. She had seen headlights pass across her ceiling. She had seen lightning light up her room. This was neither of those things. Katie sat there in the dark, trembling, waiting for her heart to stop racing and tried to calm down. After a while, she convinced herself that she had imagined whatever it was, 
The only problem was the flash of light had left the faint image of a line dancing in her eyes, and she could still see it. As Katie stared into the empty space in front of her, it was that faint sliver of light that reminded her of the strange words Jack recited, the words that accompanied the traveling spell. Set ye door at the Norworld's sliver of a splinter's eye to ye dwelling place, then rest ye brow at the spot. Although Katie couldn't remember them exactly, whether she knew it or not, she could not have performed the spell any better if she tried. Set ye door at ye dwelling place meant you were to point the edge of your door to the place where you slept. That's exactly what Katie's dad had done when he left the room. Rest ye brow at the spot simply meant to lie down. Of a splinter's eye was the hard part. That meant you had to look at the door just the right way and find the exact spot where the other world would open up after you said the magic words. And that is precisely what Katie had done by accident. Katie wondered if she might be dreaming. But it was the flash of light that had caused her to sit up in bed, and here she was sitting up. When she had calmed down, she half suspected that the light had come from the edge of the door itself. After all, it was in the shape of a long thin line, and that had to be more than coincidence. Katie took a deep breath, and when her heart wasn't pounding quite so hard anymore, she decided to lie back down. She placed her head on the pillow, feeling more awake than ever as she tried to find the edge of the door again. She moved, this way and that, and felt a little silly when nothing happened. She looked right at the door and studied its shape just like she had when she first lay down. She moved just a little. Nothing. She moved again. The line of the door got thinner, but still nothing. She moved ever so slightly, what seemed like the smallest fraction of the tiniest part of an inch. The flash of light was blinding, but this time Katie didn't move. She held stone still, squinting at the silvery light that once was the edge of her door. It beamed brightly, but cast no light in the room at all. With the rest of her bedroom covered in darkness, it was like looking through a narrow slit in a wall on a bright sunny day. Set ye door at the Nor world's sliver. Was this a sliver of the Nor world she was seeing? And where on earth was that? Katie stared at the thing, wanting to get closer, wanting to sit up, but she dared not move, for fear the light would disappear again. She watched the thread of light beaming in the darkness and after a short while her neck grew tired and she had to move. She shifted very slightly, but instead of going out, the light shone bright and steady. Katie moved very slowly as she sat up, then pulled the covers back and climbed out of bed, never taking her eyes off the light. She patted the floor with her feet till she found her slippers. When she was ready, she started forward to get a better look, fully expecting the light to disappear at any moment. But the closer she got, the more she thought she could make something out. With a few more steps, she could actually begin to see into the narrow space of light and knew that what she had suspected was true. This was more than a light. It was indeed a thin sliver of a door to something or somewhere. Katie stared right at it, as hard as she could, and although she could only see a tiny slice, she suddenly knew what it was she was looking at. What's more, she knew where it was. Katie tried to stay calm as she drew closer, longing to get a better look. She crept forward with her arms outstretched, teetering like a tightrope walker on a string. The closer she got, the more she feared it would all disappear. Instead, the opening seemed to grow wider, as her curiosity drew her forward and she stared in wonder. When she finally crossed the dark floor, Katie was bathed in light. She could hear the faint sound of birds chirping and the rustling of leaves as a cool breeze began to blow across her face. Standing there, she paused for the briefest of moments, 
wondering whether she was dreaming or awake, then tried to remind herself to tell Jack that his traveling spell actually worked. And without another thought of the past or future, she stepped through the opening and disappeared from her quiet bedroom and the world she called home. A moment later, the guardian angel returned with a flaming sword in hand, then rushed to the magic portal, only to see it close before his eyes. In an instant he became fully visible, and Katie's room was suddenly ablaze with his heavenly light. The seven-foot angel grabbed the edge of Katie's door, searing the paint with his touch, and clenched his teeth in anger. The little girl had stepped out of this world and entered another, and now that she was gone, the powers of darkness had outsmarted him, and there was nothing he could do. The warrior of God stood in the earthly realm and slowly looked toward heaven. To follow the child would not only require the permission of God, it would call for another guardian that was far greater than he. With that, the angel sneered at the dark powers that were still at work and disappeared into the night. Hello, and welcome to the Brave Traveler podcast, episode four, for fans of the supernatural, tales of fantasy and adventure. Welcome back. A quick fun fact about the story, as I was telling it to my sons, I asked them to come up with a name for the wizard. My four-year-old came up with something like Poopy Guy or something. I told him I didn't think that was going to work. My seven-year-old, however, said, How about Gilzuin? I asked him, Where'd you get that? And he said, I made it up. Gilzuin it was. When I started writing the story, I thought I'd do a Google search and I typed in Gilzuin, and the word joylessness popped up for some reason. Creepy, but perfect. So I used it in the story. As for the name of the goblin, you can find it on your keyboard. No, the goblin's name is not Tab. Before we continue, if you like this content, please subscribe, hit the notification button, tell the like button to wake up, and let's go, because I got some reading to do. Episode 4, Majesty, the Sorcerer and the Saint, Chapter 3, The Chase When Katie stepped into the light, she was standing at the edge of a field with a large wooden fence behind her, a white three-railed fence with posts ten feet apart that ran the length of the open field. Beyond it was a narrow country road. She had seen this place before. It was the very same spot she had been to earlier that day. Only now she was standing on the other side of the fence with the huge green pasture stretching out in front of her. It was midday and the sun was high in the sky. Katie walked under the shade of a tall oak, then blinked a few times to make sure she wasn't seeing things. There, in the distance, was the white horse, standing in the middle of the field just as she remembered him. She stared silently. The horse was a good ways off, nearly fifty yards. With one step, then another, she started forward slowly and found herself tiptoeing through the grass as though she were having fun sneaking up on a mouse. Just then, the horse raised his head and looked right at her. She stopped and giggled, then crept forward again. If only she could get close enough to touch him, it was all she wanted. And then he bolted. With a few long strides, he doubled the distance, and Katie yelled, Snowball, wait! Amazingly, the animal paused and turned to look back. The horse seemed to know its name. Katie laughed at the thought, but laughter turned to surprise when the horse reared up on its hind legs, then turned and galloped away. Wait! she cried again, then chased after him and watched the horse disappear in the row of trees at the edge of the clearing. She ran across the pasture without a care of what lay beyond the woods and quickly ducked inside the forest. She scurried around trees and hopped over tufts of tall grass, following the horse as it weaved its way through the woods up ahead. 
It was all she could do to keep sight of the beautiful animal, and even though she knew it was impossible to catch him, chasing after the horse was so much fun. Katie giggled as she ran and knew she had to be dreaming. She felt lighter than air with the wind in her face, her hair flowing behind her, and her slippers flitting through the blades of tall grass and barely seemed to touch the ground. On and on she went through the maze of trees, laughing and running, but no matter how fast she went, the white horse remained at a distance. When Katie finally paused to catch her breath, she looked back and saw there was no path or trail, only the thick woods all around her, and everything looked the same. Strangely, the white horse had stopped to look as well. Katie smiled at him. Surely he knew the way back to the big green pasture. There is no need to worry. All she had to do was keep him in sight. Suddenly the animal bolted again and was off in a flurry of leaves and a cloud of dust. Wait! Katie cried and ran on with the horse just ahead, never getting any closer or any further away. The white stallion ducked in and out of autumn trees that were suddenly filled with leaves of amber and scarlet. Katie kept running and hardly noticed that the trees were changing colors. Above her, gray clouds rolled across the sky, like a dark curtain slowly being drawn over the land, and as the light grew dimmer, the horse became strangely bright until he glistened like a jewel in the woods. Soon the forest was darkened, and the tall young trees were hunched over and stooped with age. They reached down with twisted branches, and when Katie finally thought to look, the lush green forest was filled with shadows, and all at once the old trees with their knotted limbs began to melt away until there were barely any trees left at all. When the horse finally stopped, Katie looked around with a growing fear, for everything was turned to night, and she was hopelessly lost. How could this be? Where had all the trees gone? she wondered, then turned to see the animal watching her and nodding its head up and down. It seemed to be beckoning her to follow, and for the first time Katie got the impression that the horse had not merely been running, but was actually leading her somewhere. She also sensed that in some strange way, whatever he was leading her to was somehow responsible for all of this. The white horse turned and walked on, leading the way more slowly. Wait! Please, wait! Where are you taking me? Katie's voice echoed into the night as she followed in earnest, looking around fearfully. The animal walked aimlessly across the hard and rocky ground that trailed off into the night, and Katie followed, trying to avoid the sharper stones beneath her feet. She spent most of her time looking down as she made her way forward, glancing up every now and then to make sure the horse was still there. She limped and stumbled in her fluffy little slippers and did her best to keep up. Then, when she was sure she could go no further, Katie looked, and to her surprise the horse had stopped. She stood there staring blankly. Was he lost? Perhaps it had come to its senses and was too afraid to venture any further. Yes, Katie thought to herself, that was it. Now it will turn around and go back, back to that beautiful green pasture. Waiting there in the cold gray darkness, Katie could only hope. She looked at the horse, and the horse looked back at her as though it had suddenly reached its destination, which appeared to be in the middle of nowhere. Katie just stared at the animal and wished she had never followed the white horse. I'm so stupid, Katie heard herself say, then paused when she realized it wasn't her voice. Indeed, she hadn't uttered a word, yet she could have sworn she heard something, a little squeaky voice that barely sounded human. All alone, are we? There it was again. Katie hesitated, then looked behind her. She saw no one and felt silly for even looking. All the stupid ones usually are. Alone, that is. Till you showed up, said the voice. Katie looked again, and again she saw no one. She looked all around and finally glanced down at her feet. There she found a fat little chipmunk sitting on the rocky ground next to her left bunny slipper. Katie jumped back, 
when the chipmunk sat up, gave her a disapproving look, and folded its tiny arms across its furry chest. He tricked you too, eh? Katie didn't know what to think. Are you talking to me? she asked. I'd turn around if I were you. Corvandia is no place for the likes of you, nor for me for that matter. I, I beg your pardon, Katie said, not sure how she should properly address a chipmunk, especially a chipmunk that talked. The little creature looked off into the night with a thoughtful gaze. Joylessness, joylessness, he said, sounding very tired. Katie decided to stop talking and just let the little creature have its say. Joylessness is to blame. Joylessness has come to our land, and all was darkened. He is responsible for all this, you know. He is a curse to this place. Katie tried not to look too confused, but she couldn't help it. He, she said. Who? The chipmunk looked at her as though she were crazy. He who? He who? Joylessness! Joylessness! Haven't you been listening? He said. Katie drew back a little. I'm sorry, but I don't understand. You talk as though joylessness was a person. The tiny chipmunk looked at Katie and laughed. Ha! A person? A person, child? You have to have a heart to be a person. He's more of a monster than, than anything else. Gelzuin is his name, and he is joylessness himself. The chipmunk turned around and started to walk away. The throne's changed hands. It's all gone bad. He said, then called back over his shoulder. Don't say I didn't warn you. Katie just watched him and marveled as the little chipmunk padded off into the dark. But before he got too far, he stopped and stood up on his hind legs, then raised his arm and shook his tiny chipmunk fist in the direction of the white horse. Rogad, you're an evil, wicked sod! The chipmunk yelled out in a squeaky little voice, to which the horse snorted and shook its head defiantly. The chipmunk looked back at Katie. Beware the great brown bear! He is out of sorts now that he has lost the throne. Then, with a courteous nod, the chipmunk started off again and disappeared into the darkness. Katie watched him go, then looked at the white horse which she regarded with greater suspicion and doubt. In spite of the warning, she took a chance and stepped forward. The horse didn't move. She took another step, then another, and still the horse appeared unconcerned as she drew nearer. She wanted nothing more than to climb aboard the back of the animal and ride him out of the strange land. Again, it was this thought that kept her going. Soon she was closer than she had ever been, only ten yards away when she stopped again. She hadn't seen the huge rusted axe with its blade buried in the ground next to the animal. The tip of the enormous axe was firmly embedded in the rock and held the weapon with its handle pointed up in the air. She looked from the battered blade to the smooth ground beneath her feet. There were large gray stones carefully set into place all around her. There were even strange designs etched into their smooth surface. Katie started toward the horse once more. How odd, she thought, that these fine stones with their peculiar designs should be in the middle of nowhere with those great stone pillars. At least the jagged rocks were gone now, and she could walk more easily. Katie stopped and looked around in shock. Great stone pillars? Her eyes bulged wide. There were twelve enormous stone pillars, six on either side of her. Where had they come from? she wondered. They weren't there a minute ago. Were they? Maybe I just didn't see them. Impossible, she thought. Whatever the case, they were there now. She shook her head, feeling like she was going a little crazy and kept her eyes wide open in case anything else should suddenly appear. And just then, something did. There was a terrible and loud creaking sound, the air-splitting noise of ancient iron hinges pleading to be oiled. Katie expected that such a terrible sound would surely frighten the white horse, but strangely enough the animal didn't even flinch and just stared at her with cold, dark eyes.
as an invisible door swung open in the empty space behind it. The bright orange glow covered Katie and lit the ground around her. It glared forth, and she shaded her eyes so she could see the open doorway that had suddenly appeared with its great stone entrance. Other things started to appear as reality shifted all around her, and Katie could hardly believe it when even the white horse began to change shape before her very eyes. The animal became darker. Its smooth skin began to wrinkle and sprout warts. It reared up on its hind legs, which grew shorter and thicker, then hunched over like some terrible beast. Its neck shrunk down to a fat stump, and its forelegs became huge, hairy arms. Scraps of cloth, bits of armor, and animal hide held together with leather straps were suddenly wrapped around and draped over the creature's body, and before Katie could even begin to think, the transformation was complete. The horrible ogre, Rogad, reached down and drew his axe out of the stone which made the blade ring. He held the weapon in his massive fist and grinned. The creature was so big and ugly, it didn't matter that he was missing half of his teeth. Katie would have screamed if it weren't for the massive structure that was still appearing all around her. It loomed out of the darkness as though it had been there all along, hidden from view by some impossible source of magic. The dark castle walls stretched out on either side of her, while the castle towers seemed to go up and up, disappearing into the darkness. To the left and right of the great castle doors stood two stone giants, thirty feet tall. Their hulking forms held perfectly still and peered down at the child with dark, brooding faces that were chipped and cracked with age. The moss-covered statues were cold and lifeless, and Katie was thankful of that. When the veil of magic was lifted, she staggered back, her mind reeling in disbelief. The space around her was now a huge open courtyard surrounded by fortress walls, while high above, dark creatures milled about and looked down from their sentry posts. Katie stared wide-eyed, trying to take it all in, then jumped when the ogre moved aside. Something was coming. Light surrounded the figure that appeared in the doorway of the castle, and Katie instantly knew that this was him, the one who was responsible for all of this. The man stood straight and tall and looked down with eyes as dark as the grave. He was draped in a long bronze robe, a lavish and regal garment that swept the ground when he walked. The material was thick and flecked with red speckles that shimmered like polished copper in the dim torchlight. His fur-lined collar covered his shoulders like a lion's mane and made him look grand and powerful. He came forward to get a better look at Katie, who stood there trembling. She watched him glance toward the sky, and when his steely gaze came to rest upon her once again, his lips curled into a devilish grin, and he spoke, How nice! How absolutely splendid! The mouse has followed the cheese. Welcome, Katie Campbell. I am Gelzuin, he said, with a voice that almost purred. Katie stood rooted to the spot. He knew her name, and as if that weren't bad enough, she knew his as well. When she realized where she had heard it, Katie jumped back, covered her mouth, and gasped. She hadn't recognized it when the chipmunk had said it, but now she was sure of it. It was the same name Jack had mentioned, the name on the sheet of paper, Gilzuin's Sorcery and House of Something or Other. She remembered thinking that the name was silly when she first heard it, and figured that whoever had made it up could have spent a little more time thinking of a better one. She had no idea that the name was real, and had a real person attached to it, but as the chipmunk had warned her, this was not a person. This thing standing before her wasn't even human. One look and Katie knew that this was a wizard. He looked more like a wizard than anything possibly could. Perhaps it was his narrow eyebrows that were arched beyond belief, or the way he stood, poised for the moment, or his bedeviled smile. Katie couldn't tell what it was exactly, but knew he looked incredibly sly. 
Everything about him, even his sparkling teeth, looked sly, if not a little too pointy. He was tall, with hair as black as oil. Katie would have guessed he was in his forties, but in human years he was closer to five hundred and forty. Gold and lead beads braided into his hair showed that he was a wizard of great acclaim and a master above many. Katie tried to catch her breath as she gazed at the wizard. From the looks of things, Jack was right. Wizards were indeed real. She glanced over at the horrible ogre that was still glaring at her. It appeared that ogres were real as well, and now that she had seen it all, Katie wanted to run, but since her feet wouldn't move, she used what little courage she had to remain standing and tried not to shake. The traveling spell, she heard herself say, and was surprised that she could even make her mouth work under such horrible conditions. Yes, smiled the wizard. The spell is mine, he said, and turned away, with his robe billowing behind him then shouted an order that made Katie jump. "'Bring her!' he said. The horrible ogre came forward. It took huge steps, hunched over as its head lolled from side to side. The creature looked clumsy with its long arms banging against its knees. Katie watched him come closer and closer until he towered over her and his shadow covered her like an inescapable wave. Before she could move, the beast tossed his axe from one hand to the other, then reached out and grabbed her. Its thick, leathery fingers squeezed Katie's arm tightly and held her like a vice. She pulled, kicked, and struggled to break free, but only managed to flop around like a helpless doll. As the big, ugly monster brought her along, her feet skittering across the courtyard stones as he dragged her inside the castle. Chapter 4 Before Gelzuin's Throne Katie had no idea where the beast was taking her. All she could think about was the ogre's monstrous hand wrapped around her arm. The creature's skin felt like sandpaper that scratched her and made her wince as she staggered and stumbled behind him. Please! Katie cried. Let me go! Rogat ignored the child and never looked back as he grunted and snorted and brought her through the stony corridors of the castle, past flaming torches and towering pillars. Soon they came upon another beastly ogre, standing guard at the entrance of a large chamber. This was Slag. His lower jaw jutted out with huge yellow teeth that curled up on either side of his nose. Katie stared at the thick, ugly beast that growled and watched her with great suspicion as she stumbled past and entered the dark hall. Rogad plodded forward, and once they were inside, he released the girl, snarled, then turned around and exited the chamber, slamming the heavy oak doors behind him. Katie rubbed her wrist as she backed away and found herself standing in a pool of light. When she turned around, Gelzuin was smiling down on her from atop his dark throne, while all around things waited in the shadows just beyond her view. Strange shapes that were holding still, trying not to be noticed. As her eyes adjusted, she could start to see them. They were woodland creatures, large plumed peacocks, great horned deer, badgers and wolves, all gathered around, looking at her, blinking. Slowly, a little red bushy-tailed fox came forward and took a few steps into the light then sniffed the air and quickly returned to the shadows. The animals looked on and waited patiently, as though they expected the child to say something important. Soon other things began to emerge, creatures that moved among the animals. They were little people, dwarves and elves, that pointed and watched and could hardly stand still, while behind them stood the darker creatures. These were worst of all, and Katie tried not to look at them, there were ogres and goblins, imps, urchins, frightful creatures like lizard monkeys, winged jackals, and other nameless things that only lived in nightmares. Most of them tended to stay in the shadows where they belonged, but Katie could hear them grunting and snorting, chattering among themselves, filled with curiosity. Suddenly there was something hurrying out of the shadows, but before Katie could scream, the hideous hook-nosed goblin scampered up, pointed his bony finger at her, and laughed. Ha! 
he jeered with great satisfaction, then quickly made his way up the throne steps and perched himself next to the wizard like a vulture. Numlock peered down at Katie and grinned. He was happy to be back in the Nor world and anxious to see what would become of the little girl now that she was without her precious guardian. Another noise echoed from out of the darkness and distracted Katie from the ugly little creature. There were heavy footsteps and the sound of long claws scraping the stone floor. Katie backed away, her eyes growing wider as she watched the huge beast lumbering out of the darkness. Beware the great brown bear, the chipmunk had said, and the warning echoed in her mind. The animal walked into the light and Katie froze. The bear was truly massive. His head alone was bigger than she was. His legs were the size of tree trunks. His barrel-shaped body was well over a thousand pounds, and his fur glistened a deep, rich red that shone like auburn. The animal moved slowly as it came forward and looked right at the child with his golden-brown eyes. Katie wanted to faint. She wished she could faint, but she was too scared and unable to move. She feared the monstrous beast would gobble her up in one bite. But to Katie's absolute amazement, the great bear continued on and walked right past her. Katie stumbled as she forced her stiff legs to move so she could see where the beast was going. She watched the bear mount the first few steps of the throne, then sit down at the wizard's feet. When Katie had calmed herself, her first thought was that the animal was the wizard's pet. But she began to think otherwise when the great bear sat up, leaned forward, and rubbed its chin as though it were studying her quite carefully. Katie stared back in utter disbelief. Then, as if that weren't surprising enough, the enormous beast opened its mouth and spoke. A child of God, he said in a deep rumbling voice, and shook his head. There was a gasp from the shadows, as though this was a terrible development. Calm yourself, my dear Bromwyn. All is well, I assure you, the wizard said as if to dismiss the animal with a word. The bear growled as he climbed down from the steps of the throne that was once his, then slowly walked around the child to observe her. With his chest out and his head held high, Katie could see he was indeed a king. He stood in front of her and gave a disapproving glance down at her bunny slippers, which were a little ragged, but smiled up at Bromwyn with their usual pleasant grin. Katie looked at the bear in horror. They're not real, I promise. They're just my slippers, she said, and wiggled her toes to prove it. The bunny slippers nodded as if to say it was true and no harm done. The bear huffed, and Katie breathed a sigh of relief when he turned away to face the wizard. Bromwyn growled loud enough for everyone in the great chamber to hear. All is not well, wizard, Bromwyn said. She is a child of God, a bearer of light. You had no right to bring her here. Gelzuin peered down from his throne. Do not forget who is in charge, dear Bromwyn. I will tell you when you are in danger and when you are not, he said. Bromwyn growled back. How did you do it? He demanded, but the wizard only smiled and seemed to enjoy the growing sense of confusion that surrounded the child and her arrival. Bromwyn turned to Katie once more. Do you know where you are, child? He asked in a voice so deep Katie could feel it grumbling inside of her. No, sir, but I'd like to go home now, if I may, Katie said. Bromwyn stepped closer and looked her in the eyes. This is the Nor world, the middle kingdom between the moon and the stars, past the cities of Jasper and Gold, beyond the earthly realm of slumber, but near to your dreams. The bear looked on with a curious gaze, and Katie just stared. She had no idea how to respond, or even if she should. The wizard smirked at her charming innocence, and Bromwyn sighed. <sighs> Indeed, you are innocent. The heavenly spheres are beyond your concern. Yet here you are. So how did you get here? 
How did you come to be in our world? The bear said, wondering aloud. Katie understood very little, except for the last question. I came through the door. My door? The bear looked at her questioningly. I mean, the side of my door? She added, trying to be helpful, but there was no reaction, until she said, It was a traveling spell. The bear growled once again, and Katie could feel the sound of it go right through her. Bromwyn turned to face Gelzuin and bared his fangs at the wizard. Uh, more of your evil magic to defy the law. You bridge the gap between worlds and bring God's wrath upon us all. What I do is no concern of yours, Gelzuin answered and sat back, casually admiring one of the larger rings on his fingers. I will use my magic as I see fit. Bromwyn glared at the wizard. You have taken my throne and cast your spell of fear over my people. But you do not frighten me, wizard. The fact remains. You have taken a child of God and placed her in harm's way. In doing so, you have angered the Almighty and will surely pay. The wizard raised an eyebrow and stared at the bear with an intensity that would have made any lesser creature wilt away. But Bromwyn was not done. Katie backed away from the ferocious power of the animal. Mark my words, wizard. As sure as I stand here before you, I... The bear's words ceased abruptly and the hall fell silent. Katie watched as every living creature pulled back into the shadows and waited for Bromwood to continue. When he didn't, she finally looked to see what was wrong and gasped. The great brown bear had turned to stone. Welcome back to the Brave Traveler podcast. For fans of the supernatural, tales of fantasy and adventure, and stories of creatures mythological. Thank you for putting up with my narrator's accent. The truth is, I couldn't deal with my own voice. To get through the reading, I needed something more expressive and colorful. I wanted to hire the great Max McLean, but it turns out I'm a heck of a lot cheaper. If you like this content, please subscribe, be sure to share it with others, and give a thumbs up. I'm glad you're here, and thank you for listening. Now let's pick up where we left off. Episode 5 Majesty, the Sorcerer and the Saint Chapter 3 Before Gelzuin's Throne The statue of the bear was perfect to the finest detail. From the rough stone texture of its fur, to its smooth, polished claws that glistened in the dim light. Had it been carved by a master sculptor, it would have been a work of art. But this was a frightful work of magic, and Katie could only stare at the lifeless creature standing before her. Still, for all her fear, there was something hauntingly peaceful about the thing. It was covered in a light frost that sparkled like diamond dust. Katie summoned her courage, she reached out and touched the icy surface, then pulled back her hand and whispered, What have you done? The wizard looked down and smiled as he admired his own handiwork. I like my subjects a little more soft-spoken. Remember that, child. It will serve you well. Suddenly he paused to glance around the room, then turned to Katie with a look of surprise. My dear, it seems you have forgotten something. Katie looked around her. It seems you've misplaced your guardian. I'm afraid that was not very wise. The Norworld is a very dangerous place, especially for a human child. You really should have one, you know. A guardian, that is. The wizard mocked her with a look of concern. Don't worry. The challenge will not go unanswered. It's all part of the plan, he said with a fiendish grin then sat back in the shadows and waited. 
in a distant land known as Paradise, where angels guard the twelve gates of heaven and towering mansions pierce the clouds. The heavenly host was assembled and the army of God stood ready. Glistening warriors gathered together to see who among them would be chosen to rescue the child that had been spirited away into darkness. The archangel Michael stood like a general before the assembly. There were seraphim and cherubim, the angel Gabriel, Azrael, the mighty Uriel, and a thousand gilded warriors ready to heed the call. Then from the heavenly throne came a beam of light that shone down upon a lone warrior, an angel with the heart of a lion. The mighty guardian stepped forward from among the ranks and knelt to receive the assignment from God. In an instant, a brilliant ray burst forth from the hallowed halls and shot into the sky above the star-spangled realm. It whistled from one end of the great expanse to the other in the twinkling of an eye. At the leading edge of that brilliant ray was the mighty soldier of God rocketing forward at speeds unimaginable, trailing fire for a hundred miles. The angel plunged downward, forging through the clouds like a fiery comet, and looked to the world below. Soon he was skimming the treetops, his eyes like living lanterns, searching the dark land as he approached. And thus God's wrath descended swiftly in the form of an angel, known as Stadia. Katie stood next to the stone bear, and the creatures in the dark throne room stared at what remained of their goodly king. They all feared the wizard and his power, and kept their murmurings to themselves, all except one. The light flashed out of the darkness and rose above the crowd, shimmering brightly. It dropped down and darted around the bear, then hovered over his head, fluttering on sparkling wings. Katie shied away from the golden light until it held still long enough for her to see, then stared in wonder. The little fairy was barely two inches tall and glistened like a star. Yet for one so small, her tiny voice caught everyone's attention. Kitch cried out in anger, You monster! A pox upon your lot! You double-dabbed monster! How could you? She yelled. Gilzuin turned aside in disgust. I hate fairies, he said, looking toward the wall. That's because you have no power over us, you beast! If I could, I'd cast you into the lake of fire myself! Gilzuin's eyes glowed like red-hot coals as he glared at the fairy and growled. It will take more than you, my dear Kitch, far more than you. The glowing fairy was full of fire and bold as she could be as she hovered over the stone bear, her tiny wings a blur. Katie gazed at the little creature when suddenly the throne room doors burst open. Before Katie could turn around, Rogad and the other ogre came tumbling in and rolled across the stone floor until they were sprawled out flat on their faces. The two monsters laid there groaning and were either unwilling or unable to stand. Gelzuin and all the dark creatures looked to see what had happened when a loud voice echoed across the hall. Fear, Fear not! not. not. The words rang through the dark chamber as a tall figure of a man strode into the throne room. A long gray cloak flowed around him. It draped all the way to the floor and fully covered his brilliant armor. A gilded helmet of silver and gold was upon his head and had a luster that glowed brightly. Although his wings remained invisible, the warrior angel was dressed for battle, and as he came forward and removed his helmet, Katie could see... His was a face etched by the hand of God. His eyes glistened like sapphire. His hair shimmered like spun gold and flowed about his shoulders. The angel was beautiful and strong. With just one look, Katie was lost in his perfect countenance and knew that he was her defender. The wizard, however, was not as impressed and nestled himself in the comfort of his throne. Speak of the angel, Gelzuin said. The golden-haired stranger approached with his helmet tucked under his arm, and as he drew nearer, a sense of peace rose within Katie that told her who and what he was. When he finally stood before her, Katie tilted her head back till she was nearly looking straight up. 
You're an angel, aren't you? she said. Indeed I am, child of God, he answered softly. I am Stadia. Are you all right? Katie loved the warmth of his voice and smiled till her eyes nearly shut. I am now, she said. I am now. Suddenly Gelzuin's eyes turned black as coal, and the wizard jumped to his feet upon hearing the angel's name. "'What's this?' the creatures in attendance pulled back even further. "'Where is the archangel? Where is Michael?' Stadius smiled down on Katie and only gave the wizard a casual glance. "'This is an outrage! Speak to me, minion! Answer me!' Gelzuin demanded. Stadia took his time as he turned to face the wizard with a long, slow gaze. Spare yourself. Your threats are meaningless. If it were not for Almighty God who has sent me, I would have no need to grace you with an answer. The archangel is about his business. That is all you need to know. Gilzuin shook with rage. His black eyes bulged as his face turned red than a darker shade of purple. Katie squinted and took a few steps back, afraid he might actually pop. Then, as quickly as he had been arisen to anger, the wizard suddenly became calm again. When he returned to normal, he took a deep breath and forced a smile. You are trying to bait me, aren't you? Very clever. Very clever indeed. The wizard looked the angel up and down. Perhaps I shall have great sport toying with you, after all, and when I have done... Your lord shall think better next time and send me a real challenge. The angel smiled. I shall do my best not to disappoint you, he said, then turned his attention to the statue of the bear. This is your handiwork, is it not? Return the bear now. The fairy Kitch flew near the angel and yelled out, Yes, yes, return him back, you wicked toad. Gelzuin leaned forward and glared at the fairy, who quickly darted behind the angel and peeked out over his shoulder. You heard him, she added boldly. The angel locked eyes with the wizard. It was a direct challenge, and all the creatures in attendance watched eagerly to see what would happen next. A few moments later, the wizard simply sat back on his throne and smiled. Of course, as you wish the wizard said slyly. With a flick of his wrist, stone turned back to flesh and fur. The bear was back and Bromwyn's booming voice echoed throughout the chamber as he finished the sentence he had started just before the spell had been placed upon him. I will not allow you to harm this child of God. Do you hear? As long as there is breath within me, I will fight you. Everyone smiled at the bear who was completely unaware of what had happened. Just then, Bromwyn turned to see the angel with a look of surprise, and Stadia smiled down on him. Fear not, dear king. The favor of God is upon you. I have come to help. Bromwyn bowed before the angel, humbled by his presence. The Lord is merciful. Angel of God, you are most welcomed. Bromwyn rose and quickly took the opportunity to plead his case against the wizard. This, this creature has taken control of my kingdom. With the use of magic, the ogres and his evil horde, he has turned our land into a place of darkness. Though he has promised to leave here, once he has found what he is looking for, there is no truth in him. I trust him not. Suddenly, a little man stepped forward, barely four feet tall. His bright red beard and dark brown eyes shimmered in the torchlight as he thrust his fist into the air. Here, here! yelled Gogarth, leader of the dwarf people. Gogarth was rugged, his skin as tan as leather, his hands as big as oven mitts. The dwarf was dressed in rawhide and wore high boots with a thick leather belt that held a short sword strapped to his side. Others yelled their approval as another dwarf stepped forward, plump as a dumpling with a face as round as a pan. His clothes were made of the finest elk yarn and were neatly tailored. This was Gimble, and Katie liked him the moment she saw him. He nodded at her and doffed his large rakish hat, which had a big white feather tucked in its brim. 
Other dwarfs rallied behind the angel as well, then more and more, until all of the woodland creatures and the king's loyal subjects were cheering as one. The darker creatures, ogres and goblins alike, sneered and rattled their weapons, and in the midst of the uproar the wizard finally raised his hands. Wait! Hear me! Hear me! he shouted. The bear has spoken correctly. I have no quarrel with you, dwarves, elves, woodlanders, any of you. As soon as I have found that which I seek, I swear by the fiery tongue of the Gullock, I shall leave this place. Stadia's eyes narrowed as he spoke. And what is this thing which you seek? he asked. The wizard paused, and every living creature leaned forward, waiting to hear the answer, and would have gladly given the wizard whatever he wanted to make him go away. I seek the white horse, the white horse known as Majesty, the wizard called out in a loud voice for all to hear. At first there was silence, then Katie could hear the name repeated softly over and over again. The word spread throughout the chamber until everyone was staring anxiously. Katie was a little shocked herself. She found it peculiar that they all seemed to know about the white horse. After all, that's how she'd come to be here. She was chasing what she thought was a white horse, and now it just so happened that this wizard was looking for a white horse as well. Katie suddenly felt a knot in her stomach and suspected the answer to the mystery would not be a pleasant one. The crowd was still murmuring and seething anxiously when there came the tiny sound of laughter. The fairy flew out from behind the angel, and the goblin and ogres gave curious glances. Kitch laughed so hard she bobbed like a feather on the air until she came to rest on the great bear's back. The tiny creature rolled around in Bromwyn's fur, kicking her feet and beating her fists, then held her belly, unable to control her laughter. When she finally sat up, she looked at the wizard with a chuckle and a snort, then burst out laughing again. Bromwyn looked back to see the fairy slip off of his shoulder with her wings aflutter and plop down onto the floor next to him. Katie couldn't help herself and smiled as she came closer and stooped down. What's so funny? she asked, and had to wait a while for the fairy to settle down again. Kitch took a deep breath and finally climbed to her feet, exhausted. She looked up into Katie's big brown eyes and said, <laughs> oh, The wizard is wasting his time. Everybody knows that no one knows where the white horse is. The wizard smiled cleverly and pointed at Katie. Then this child, my dear fairy, is that no one of whom you speak, for she knows far more than you think. Kitch stopped smiling. It was an absurd statement. The angel Stadia turned to look at the little girl, then King Bromwyn, then Gogoth, and Gimble, and suddenly everyone in the chamber was looking at the little human child. Katie stood there, scratching her leg and squinting, which is what she did when she didn't know what to do. She had no idea what the wizard was talking about, and could only think of one thing to say. I want to go home, she whined. The word home, 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 home echoed throughout the chamber as all the creatures pondered what the wizard had said. It was obvious from Katie's expression that she didn't appear to know anything, but the wizard seemed quite certain of his claim. Stadia stepped forward. Wizard, I know not what scheme you have laid out before you, but I know this. It will not involve this innocent child. You will deal with me directly. Gelzuin looked down from his throne. You are of no concern to me, angel. My interest is in your master. I seek to defeat the Lord of Glory himself. With that, every creature in the throne room gasped. One dwarf suddenly fainted, another screamed while others stumbled and pushed their way out of the chamber, fearing a lightning bolt would surely burst through the ceiling and strike them all dead. Blasphemer! King Bromwyn roared. Kitch darted behind the angel again, 
while others stood trembling. Gelzuin narrowed his eyes, then leant forward and glared. I will not only defeat the Lord of Glory, but I will use this child to do it, and there is nothing you can do to stop me. Hearing that, Stadia advanced on the wizard and marched up the stone steps, when Gelzuin called out, Careful, angel, lest you jeopardize this innocent child of God. Stadia glared back. You have no power over her. She is under my protection, he insisted. The wizard sighed. Ah, yes. But what of her brother? Her dear, non-believing brother? What protection do you offer him? What does he mean? What about my brother? Yes, such a problem. What to do? It appears that your brother's lack of faith has put him out, so to speak, and your mighty angel here is powerless to help him. I wonder where the boy is now. I certainly hope he is safe, Gelzuin said and smiled. Stadia backed away from the wizard, and Katie rushed up beside him. I, I don't understand. W what, what does he mean? she asked, gazing up at the angel. Stadia frowned and looked down as though he were trying to figure out his next move. A moment later he turned to Katie. I must go, he said. No! You can't leave me here! Take me with you! she pleaded. Stadia stooped down and put his hand on her shoulder. I dare not take you away. Our Lord has allowed this to happen for a reason. And when I return, we will find the answer together. Till then, there is nothing to fear. You will hardly know that I have gone. As Stadia spoke, Katie looked at the wizard and his goblin and all the horrible creatures that surrounded the throne. You will be safe as long as you do not speak to the wizard. He is very clever, but say nothing to him. Do not talk to him until I return. Say nothing at all. Is that clear? Katie felt a little braver and nodded her head. Just then the tiny fairy zipped through the air quick as a spark and landed on Katie's shoulder. Don't worry. I'll be with her the whole time. She won't say a word. Kitch saluted the angel like a proud little soldier, and King Bromwyn came alongside to add a word of reassurance. We will protect her until your return. Stadia stood to his feet, nodded to the bear and the fairy, then looked to the wizard. If you harm so much as a single hair on her head, I will grind your bones to dust. The wizard bowed politely to acknowledge the threat. With that, the angel turned, his long gray cloak billowing behind him, and left the chamber. As soon as he was gone, Rogad slammed the door shut behind him. The ogre looked at Slag, who was still sprawled out on the floor next to him, then rubbed his aching chin and bared his jagged teeth. As far as he was concerned, the little girl had become far more trouble than she was worth. Katie turned to face the wizard, and whatever courage she had quickly left her. Gelzuin smiled down from his throne with the hideous goblin by his side. Behind them, a hundred yellow eyes glared out of the darkness. It's all right, child, Bromwyn said, sensing her fear. With that, Katie wrapped her arms around his neck, which was a lot like hugging a bus, and buried her face in his thick fur. The shimmering fairy fluttered just above to offer a little more light, and standing there, lost in a dark world, Katie thanked God for her new found friends. Chapter 5 Bathan War Jack was fast asleep and although his room was dark and silent, his dream was filled with fire and magic. For in his dream, he was a powerful wizard. The evening mist settled within the hills, and the high tower of Castle Bathanwar glistened in the moonlight. 
A shadow descended silently along the tower wall as a cloaked figure came to rest on the balcony. Jack peered down with his hair matted and sweat pouring from his brow, while far below, where the stone bridge met the castle wall, two red eyes glistened in the dark. Ribbons of smoke curled up out of the shadows as the dragon waited and watched for the young wizard to show himself again. Jack smiled down at the wretched eyes glaring up dimly out of the darkness. With his wizard's cape half burnt, he could still feel the heat of the dragon's fiery breath on his back and knew he had narrowly escaped with his life. Then, with a wave of his hand, Jack turned and flung the terrace doors open wide. Once inside, they slammed shut behind him as he threw off his smoldering cape and went to his war table. There he found his maps strewn across its surface with a wooden goblet perched at the edge of the table. Jack quickly guzzled down its contents, then tossed the cup aside and peered down at the numerous scrolls ready to devise another plan to meet the beast in battle. He rummaged through the maps, flinging them here and there, when one of them happened to flip through the air and land at the feet of a dark foreboding figure standing in the shadows across the room. The giant of a man was clad from head to toe in polished black armor. The dark soldier held a grim mace in his clenched fist and stared straight ahead. Amazingly, the enormous black knight was a perfect replica of the miniature toy Jack had in real life. Only this one was eight feet tall, weighed a ton, and could actually talk. How goes the battle? echoed the deep voice from within the heavy armor, like a giant in a cave. Jack looked up and grinned at his dark companion. It was close, real close. He nearly got me. Jack said excitedly, with sweat still dripping down his brow. I flew under the bridge, and he followed me into the dark, just like I knew he would. That's when I hit him with a lightning bolt, then slipped on a rock. When he came at me, there was so much fire, I didn't think I was going to make it. He caught my cape, see? Jack pointed to the cloak still smoldering on the floor. Yes, said the Black Knight. You are most fortunate, sire. The dragon is swift for his size. He will be difficult to defeat. Not if I can get him where I want him, Jack said, as he unrolled one of his maps and pointed at the stream indicated below the castle. Here, see? The black knight tilted his head down with a noisy creak from his metal collar. His voice was slow and ponderous. Ah, uh, yes. Of course, the element of water. Dragons of the air hate the water. A brilliant strategy, he said, as Jack began to formulate his plan. If I can just get him into the deeper part of the stream, Jack paused to look around. Where are the other maps? The water charts. Jack quickly leafed through the maps on the table, then stood up sharply. I know, they're in the cabinet, he said, and whirled around so fast he didn't see the big man standing directly behind him and slammed into him like a brick wall. Jack hit the floor hard and laid there for a few seconds, then propped himself up and shook his head to clear the cobwebs. Hey! was all he could think to say as he stared up at the solemn figure. Stadia looked down as the boy slowly climbed to his feet with the towering black knight standing in the shadows. The angel gave him a cautious glance. The massive soldier was easily a foot taller and armed for battle. Jack rubbed his head. How'd you get in here? He said with a frown. Come with me, the angel commanded. Hey, I'm a wizard, you know, Jack whined as he dusted himself off. Stadia glanced at the black knight again. Listen to me. This is all an illusion. You are living in a dream. You have no powers. Now do as I say. Time is short. We must go, he said. I'm not going anywhere with you, Jack said and scowled, waiting for some response. 
as Stadia walked past and never looked back. I'm afraid your life depends upon it, he said, and sounded like he meant it. It was a threat that made Jack pause to reconsider. My life? Hey, who are you? A wispy cloud appeared at the center of the room. The angel marched forward defiantly, then without a word, disappeared into the misty realm of the Norworld. Jack watched him go, then turned to the Black Knight in a fluster and spoke as though he was late to catch a train. Um, okay, listen, if I'm not back in one hour, you come and find me, all right? He said, but the suit of armor remained silent and gave no response. With that, Jack chased after the angel. Wait! Wait for me! He yelled, then ran into the churning vapor and vanished from his dream and the castle chamber. Episode 6 Majesty, the Sorcerer and the Saint Chapter 6 The Wizard's Table The sky over Coravandia was dark and grim, but not as grim as the wizard's throne room. Many things had happened while the angel was gone. The creatures had begun to yell and argue about the angel and the human child. Most of them had never seen a child of God, and the last time the dwarves had seen an angel was during the Wizard Wars. Now there was both a child of God and an angel in the same place at the same time, and that was cause for worry. The clamor grew even louder when the ogres joined in, bellowing and howling and making so much useless noise that Katie had to let go of Bromwyn's neck to cover her ears. Enraged, the bear turned and roared. That is quite enough, the great bear said, and the hall fell silent. We need not be afraid. The angel has not come to destroy us. He is our champion. After years of ruling over his kingdom, the bear had learned to make great speeches, and now that everyone was listening, he was just warming up to it. What the wizard hath wrought, he hath borne out of his own sinful heart and brought upon himself. His own wickedness and evil deeds have found him out. He who has seized the throne with sorcery and exalted himself will be brought low this day. I tell you, the wizard is most pitiful among us, for his fate is in the hands of God and there is nothing he can do to escape judgment. Hear, 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 hear. The faithful dwarfs yelled. The little fairy smiled at Bromwyn and admired the brave king who spoke so boldly before the wizard. At the same time, she thought it strange that the wizard had not interrupted or even uttered a single word in his own defense. And when she looked, she saw the hooked-nosed goblin sitting atop the throne in the wizard's place, grinning wildly. The fairy flew to the goblin in an instant and zipped around the creature like a fiery dart. Numlock ducked and dodged to get out of her way as the fairy searched high and low, looking everywhere, only to discover that the wizard was indeed gone. He was nowhere to be found. But even worse, the child was gone as well. Furthermore, King Bromwyn said, Kitch flew to the bear in the middle of his lengthy speech, but no matter what she did, he turned aside and kept talking. Finally, she buzzed around Bromwyn's muzzle so fast the bear's whiskers caught fire. Bromwyn jumped back, sputtering and shaking his head angrily, then crossed his eyes to get a better look at his whiskers, which were still smoldering. Gimbal took one look at the cross-eyed bear and laughed. Gogarth elbowed the little dwarf and frowned, while Bromwyn turned to the fairy in anger. How dare you! Such impudence! He roared, rubbing his nose with his paw. They're gone! They're gone! Kit shouted, pointing to the goblin. Bromwyn looked to the throne, then glanced around him. But, but, 
The child was right here, Bronwyn said. Just then, someone cried, What of the angel? We've lost the child of God. What do we do now? The question was enough to cause a panic, as half of the creatures chose that moment to run while others yelled and screamed even louder. Bronwyn did his best to calm them, but it was no use. They all feared the worst. With that, the little fairy took to the air and knew she had to get above all the noise of all the creatures. She flew higher and higher, all the way up to the dark rafters, then fluttered her wings to clear the dust and sat quietly in the shadows, with the noise of the crowd still clamoring up from below. The little fairy plugged her ears and tried to concentrate. She focused her mind until the noise was little more than a distant echo, and when she was ready, she began to listen for the wizard. The fairy listened ever so carefully, her heart and mind so keen she could hear summer leaves changing colors in the cool autumn hills. Softly, quietly, she began to hear beyond the walls of the castle chamber and listened. The mind of the wizard was a cold, dark place filled with unspeakable horrors, and the little fairy wanted no part of it. But sitting there, among the shadows, she knew she had to keep listening if she was going to find Katie and rescue the child. The noise had been so loud Katie couldn't stand it. She had covered her ears and shut her eyes and wished that all of the creatures and all of the yelling and all of the noise would go away. Then all at once it did. The silence had come so quickly, Katie uncovered her ears and opened her eyes, but had to shut them again to escape the brilliant sunlight. The light of day was even more of a surprise. She had just been in the dark throne room and hadn't moved an inch, yet she could feel the warmth of the sun on her face and could have sworn she saw trees and flowers all around her. There was the occasional chirping of birds and a sweet fragrance on the air. Katie opened her eyes more slowly and squinted at the beauty that suddenly surrounded her. Her heart leapt. She was no longer in the wizard's throne room. She was bathed in sunlight and sitting in a quiet meadow, with no earthly idea of how she had gotten there. There were roses and wildflowers all around. When Katie looked down, she found herself seated in a chair that looked more like a throne that was expertly made and flawless. Exquisitely handcrafted wood adorned the high back of the chair. Its arms and legs were carved into huge ornate claws, and the cushions beneath her were made of rich red velvet with lace fringe and gold braided tassels that dangled from the corners. Stretching out before her was the longest, most elegant banquet table Katie had ever seen. Three large crystal vases were filled with exotic flowers, luscious blooms that burst with color, and set all around them on silver platters and bowls was every kind of food and dessert imaginable a bountiful meal fit for a king. Everything was perfect down to the slightest detail and would have truly been wonderful if it were not for the evil wizard who sat at the other end of the table sipping a cup of green tea. Just the sight of him was enough to make Katie's blood run cold. Gelzuin smiled and waved to her. It was a little wave that said, Hello there again. Katie thought about jumping out of her chair and running away. But since she didn't know where she was, she grabbed the chair arms, closed her eyes, and tried to concentrate on what the angel had said. Say nothing. Say nothing, she repeated over and over again, as though the words themselves would protect her from harm. Katie, the wizard called to her gently from across the long table. Katie's eyes popped open when she heard her name and looked at the wizard like a frightened deer. She couldn't bear his gaze. His eyes were a pale blue and reflected the sky, but she remembered how they blazed red as fire in a fit of rage. She sank down behind one of the floral arrangements, and the wizard called to her again. "'My dear, is something wrong?' Gelzuin said in a tone that actually sounded friendly. "'I must admit, I was rather hasty and could have handled things a bit better. I'm sure you'd agree,' he chuckled. Can you ever forgive me? Now that we're alone and away from all that noise and clatter, we can sit and talk. Katie held her breath. 
Say nothing, say nothing, she said to herself. The wizard smiled and looked on with genuine concern. Please, you don't look at all well. Are you sure you're all right? Katie peeked up over the flowers. Yes, she said, then quickly clasped her hands over her mouth as though a bird had just escaped from her lips. Say nothing, say nothing, she reminded herself. The wizard smiled like a devilish fox. I was beginning to worry. I know you've traveled a long way and thought you might like a little something to eat before you leave, before you return home. Katie's eyes lit up. Home? I'm going home? she said in surprise. Gilzuin grinned. Why, yes, of course you are. Surely you cannot stay here in the Nor world. Home is where you belong. I could have the dwarves take you back immediately, if you like, unless, of course, you'd rather have something to eat first. The clever wizard paused to let Katie look at the banquet table. There were exotic dishes wonderfully prepared, surrounded by mounds of fresh fruit. There was shrimp and lobster, steak, sausage, and omelets, a whole turkey, pheasant under glass, a broiled duck smothered in mango sauce, and even a roast pig glazed with honey and covered with juicy pineapples. Then there was a world of desserts. There were cookies and donuts, puddings and pies. There were even milkshakes and ice cream sundaes with toppings of all kinds. Soon Katie was smiling at all the delicious food in front of her. With that and the promise of home, the wizard didn't seem so bad now. Gilzuin took another sip of his tea and let out a scrumptious moan of delight. Mmm. There is nothing I like more than green tea. It is my absolute favorite. He lowered his teacup and paused, then looked at Katie as though a thought had just occurred to him. Tell me, child, what is your favorite food? Katie didn't even stop to think and popped up in her seat. Cherry cheesecake with strawberries and whipped cream swirled on top, she blurted out. My mom showed me how to make it, but Grammy Nan used to make it the best, the best cherry cheesecake in all the world. But, but that was before, before she passed away. Katie looked down and her smile faded. Oh, I'm so sorry. Do tell me about your grandmother, the wizard said, trying to sound caring and did a good job, considering the fact that he hated the old woman, since it was her prayers that had kept them away from the child. The wizard continued cleverly. I get the impression she was quite a special person. She was, Katie said, and seemed to come to life again. The wizard smiled. Now that the girl was talking, his plan was working nicely, until Katie mentioned the Bible. The wizard spit out his tea and nearly dropped his cup. The words stabbed him like a needle in the flesh and made him cringe. In fact, it made him cringe every time Katie said it, and it was all he could do to sit still as she spoke. Nana always read the Bible. She loved the Bible. She even knew parts of the Bible by heart and told the stories from the Bible. The wizard flinched and squirmed and twitched and turned like he was sitting on a tack while the girl rambled on. She had a lot of names for the Bible. She called it the Good Book, the Staff of God, the Word of God, her Pillar of Strength, but I like to call it the plain old Bible. Enough! Gail Zuin shrieked and gave Katie a start. The wizard quickly tried to compose himself. <laughs> I'm sorry, he said slowly. That was a lovely story, but I'm afraid it's getting late, and the food won't last forever, you know. <laughs> the wizard gave a weak chuckle, and Katie looked at him suspiciously. Tell me, he said, did I hear you say your grandmother made cheesecake? Yeah, Katie said reluctantly. That is very interesting, because you see I'm rather fond of cakes and pastries myself. In fact, I do believe we have some cheesecake, right over there. Katie looked to where the wizard pointed and gazed at the huge slice of cheesecake that had practically appeared out of nowhere. She couldn't imagine how she'd missed it. Strangely, the more she looked at it, the more it became just like the cherry top cheesecake she'd placed in her mind. It was absolutely perfect. The perfect sized cheesecake with a perfect swirl of whipped cream and pieces of strawberries with a perfectly plump cherry placed on top. Please, don't be shy. Go ahead, have a taste, the wizard said and sipped his tea. Katie picked up her fork, and when she took the first bite, 
the wizard could almost feel the white horse within his grasp and smiled at the human child who was obviously no match for his clever wizardry. Katie ate and talked and only paused to wipe her mouth and sip a glass of milk. It was then that the spell of enchantment took effect and she started to change. The transformation was ever so slow. She didn't feel the slightest bit different, but whether she knew it or not, with each bite she took, she was getting a little younger. Slowly, the months and years fell away, and by the time the spell was complete, Katie was as cute as she could be and looked exactly as she did when she was only nine years old. She was also three inches shorter and had to sit up straight to reach the table. She wiggled her mouth since her braces had magically disappeared, her face felt different in some strange way, and she couldn't tell how. The wizard watched her carefully and magically refilled his cup of tea. According to the feeble old wizard Marplot, a younger Katie would have twice the innocence and be more likely to remember the knowledge given to her by God. Gelzuin sat back in his chair, ready to put his theory to the test. "'Katie, how do you feel?' the wizard asked, and took a sip of tea. Fine, thank you, Katie said. Gelzua nearly gagged with laughter when he heard Katie's new voice. It was higher and squeakier than before, and the fact that she didn't notice made it even more amusing. He pretended to clear his throat and continued, <clears throat> You have been such great company, he said. Thank you, Mr. Zuin, Katie said, and the wizard smiled with delight. She even talked like a nine-year-old. "'Have you enjoyed my hospitality?' he asked. "'I have,' Katie said politely. "'Then perhaps you can return the favor,' the wizard said, smiling graciously. Katie frowned. "'You mean the white horse, don't you?' The wizard gave a sheepish smile, as though he hoped it weren't too much to ask. "'You think I know where he is, but I don't,' Katie said. "'Besides,' That was a mean trick you played on me, turning that ogre into a horse. Now that she was a little smaller, Katie was a little braver as well, and the wizard pulled back, pretending to be surprised. But, my dear, how else could I have brought you here so that you could tell me about the real horse? Katie thought for a moment, then her eyes lit up with excitement. The one I saw in the pasture? You mean Snowball? she said. The wizard frowned at the thought of such a ridiculous name being assigned to the most magnificent creature in the universe. He sat patiently and listened as Katie rambled on and on about the white horse she had seen in the pasture, then finally interrupted. Yes, yes, that is all well and good, but I want you to think and tell me about the other white horse, the one called Majesty. Where is he right now? Majesty, Katie whispered at the thought. Although she had heard him mention the name for the first time in the throne room, it was strangely familiar, then slowly came to her. You mean the horse from the book? The horse my mom told me about, she said in a whisper. I don't know, Katie replied. The wizard leaned forward. Ah, but you do know, he said, glaring at her wildly. Katie sat there, staring as blank as a chalkboard, and in her innocence she began to feel sorry for the wizard. He wanted to find the white horse so badly, but all she knew was what her mom had said, and that was hardly anything. When it became clear that the child had nothing more to say, Gelzuin rubbed his chin and tried to think. "'I know,' he said with a look of surprise. "'We'll play a little game.' and pretend that you do know. You just start talking and make up a story, all right? Just tell me a story about how to get to the white horse. But how will that help you if I really don't know? Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. You let me worry about that. Just tell me a story, the wizard smiled reassuringly. Katie didn't see how it would really help at all, but she decided the least she could do was try to come up with something. The problem was, she wasn't a very good storyteller. The wizard waited while Katie thought. She was trying to think of the kind of stuff her brother would say, magical stuff, 
stuff that would make a good-sounding story. All right, she said and smiled. This time it was the wizard who sat up in his chair, staring with eager anticipation, and as Katie spoke, he hung on her every word. There are four kingdoms you must pass through to get to the white horse, she began. Gilzuin listened like an attentive child. First, Katie said, then paused to think. She was waiting for something interesting to pop into her mind, and then she continued. First, there's the land of the giants, Katie said. The wizard gasped and covered his mouth to muffle his screams of joy. She hadn't expected that reaction. The wizard uncovered his mouth and whispered, The land of great discoveries, he exclaimed, as though the place were real and he knew exactly where it was. Go on, child, go on, he insisted excitedly. Katie smiled politely and continued. Then there is, uh... This making up stuff was tough going. What would Jack say, she thought. Then it came to her. There is the forest of the living trees, which protect the, uh, cloud stones. Those last two words didn't seem to go together. Katie smiled weakly and wanted to apologize. She felt she wasn't doing a very good job. Yes, of course, Gilzuin shouted and made Katie jump. Go on, go on, he said as though she were about to uncover buried treasure. Katie shifted in her seat, feeling a little uncomfortable. Was she better at making up stories than she thought? Or was it simply the wizard was easily impressed? She looked up into the sky, trying to think of something else to say, and just at that very moment, the little fairy popped right out of the space in front of her nose. Kitch swooped down and buzzed around Katie furiously. No, say nothing! she shouted, hovering in front of Katie's little round face. Mind what the angel told you. Do not speak to the wizard. He is... Kitch paused, then drew back in surprise. What? What has he done to you? The fairy marveled at the little girl who was now smaller and younger than the last time she had seen her, then glared at the wizard, who threw his arms up in abject rage. His eyes turned red, and he yelled at the sky, which became black as night. Suddenly, Everything went dark and was gone. The bright green meadow, the beautiful banquet table, with all of its fine food. In an instant, it had all disappeared and changed into something else. They were back in the castle, which they had never truly left, in another dark chamber, and all that remained in front of Katie was a rickety old table covered with a canvas cloth. On it was a single candle dripping wax and a dirty dish with a chunk of rotted cheese set before the child. Her grandmother's cheesecake had merely been an illusion. It was this piece of horrible thing that Katie had put in her mouth instead. She could see where she had nibbled off bits of it, and suddenly the sweet flavor of cinnamon sugar turned to the foul taste of sour milk. Katie nearly gagged as she waved the little fairy aside. <laughs> you, you tricked me, she said, spitting and sputtering out bits of the stale cheese. Suddenly the great bear and a host of dwarves and woodland creatures flooded into the dark chamber, shouting joyfully. We found her! We found, found, her. found, found her. her! They cried, thankful to see the child alive. But Katie only glared at the wizard, for he had indeed tricked her and placed her under his wicked spell. Chapter 7 The Angel and the Wizard a troop of ogres and grim goblins marched into the chamber behind the dwarves, pushing everyone aside, as they made their way to the wizard, then surrounded Gelzuin, who slumped back in his chair and stared at the little girl. It was all going so well, he muttered. Scoundrel! The bear growled and shook his paw at the wizard. Gelzuin ignored him and sneered at the sparkling fairy fluttering in the air next to the child. Meddling fairies, he groaned. Suddenly, something shook the room like an earthquake, and the stone wall behind the ogres buckled. The burly beasts and green goblins staggered out of the way just as the wall caved in, raining down chunks of rock and debris. 
when the dust settled, Stadia stepped through the gaping hole and stood atop the rubble. "'Please do come in,' said the wizard with a glance. Katie's eyes lit up as the brave guardian approached, and Jack walked in right behind him. The boy stood on the pile of rocks, looking on in amazement. "'Cool!' he exclaimed. "'That was awesome!' "'Jack, you're here! You're here!' Katie shouted and clapped for joy. But Jack's attention was firmly riveted on the angel. "'How'd you do that?' he said, gazing at the big man. But Stadia only stared at Katie, who had been shrunk down to the size of a nine-year-old. His gaze was so intense, Jack finally turned to look at his sister. "'Hey, what happened to you?' he said and laughed. Stadia looked the little girl up and down as he marched forward, then reached back and drew an enormous shield out of thin air. "'Whoa!' was all Jack could say when it miraculously appeared before them. The shield of faith was bigger than Katie and shone like glass. A thin layer of energy seemed to float over the face of the shield and gently rippled across its surface like water. The angel placed the shield before Katie so she could see her reflection, and the instant she saw herself, she smiled. Her braces were gone. There was no shock or surprise, only admiration for the image that stared back at her. Katie remembered what it was like to be nine, and recalled she rather liked that time in her life. She was cute as a button, as Dad would say, and looking at herself only brought back fond memories. Her response was not what the angel had expected, and Stadia withdrew the shield, which vanished into thin air as quickly as it had appeared. Katie looked up at the angel, and tried to look as sweet and innocent as she possibly could. I spoke to the wizard, she said rubbing one bunny slipper against the other. Stadia looked down on her. I know, he said. A moment passed, and when Katie realized that that was the extent of his anger, she smiled and turned to her brother excitedly. Jack, wait till you see, she said, and hurried past the angel. Katie pointed at the creatures huddled together in the shadows. All the animals can talk. It's amazing. Jack looked around, peering into the darkness, trying to take it all in. This place is great, he said. It's like some kind of realistic dream. It's not a dream, Jack. It was your traveling spell, remember? It brought me here. It worked. It really worked. Jack tried not to look utterly horrified as the reality of it all began to sink in. It did, he said, unable to stop his eyes from glancing at the creatures standing in the shadows. Katie nodded. How? Jack said in amazement, as though it was the most impossible thing imaginable. Katie shrugged. By accident, I guess. You mean that... that... Hey, where are we? He asked, and looked afraid, since the place they had arrived at was far more impossible than the spell that had brought them there. The fairy flew in front of Jack, and the boy stepped back from her shimmering light as Kitch announced... This is Coravandia, eastern region of the Nor world, grand domain of great King Bromwyn, born of the Fineland, who sits upon the Vandian throne. The fairy turned aside and gestured. That is until he showed up, Kitch said, and pointed behind her. The boy gazed past the glimmering fairy and peered at the dark figure seated in the shadows. Who's that? Jack said in a hushed whisper. Katie glanced over and wished he hadn't asked. Gilzuin, she said, and winced as though someone had broken a plate in the kitchen. Jack's mouth hung open as he stared at the master wizard himself. Gilzuin rose to his feet, his shiny bronze robe flickering in the dim torchlight as he loomed out of the darkness to meet the angel who glared at him angrily. What have you done to her? The angel's voice filled the room, rumbling low and steady like distant thunder. Is there no honor in you? No honor at all among your kind? There was a flash and another tremor that shook the castle. Katie backed away and turned to look out of one of the open portals in the stone wall. From there she could see storm clouds gathering in the night sky as the angel spoke. I turn my back 
and like a coward, you take advantage of an innocent child. Lightning crackled in the billowing darkness, and thunder shook the land. Katie looked at the angel, then gazed up at the night sky. It was as though the sky reflected his anger, and his words were followed by thunder. The ogres and goblins stood behind Gelzuin, then shrank away, as the power of God was revealed in his messenger. But once again, the wizard was unimpressed. You would challenge me to test your strength, but such power would shake this castle to its foundation. Look around you. Surely you would not wish that any harm should come to these poor creatures as a result of your holy wrath poured out upon me, Gelzuin said slyly. As for the child, I assure you she is unharmed. Look at her. She is the picture of innocence, and you have me to thank for it. Stadia was hardly amused and held his piercing gaze upon the wizard. Anyway, you are too late. She has already told me more than I needed to know. Then release her, Stadia demanded. When I am done, and now that you've been good enough to bring me the boy, you will mind what you say, and be careful to use the door the next time. Stadia grabbed his sword. You try my patience, wizard. Do not presume to tell me what to do. I have only one lord. The wizard beckoned to the angel to come closer. And when they were face to face, he spoke so softly only Stadia could hear. The girl will do as I say, because I possess her brother. His soul belongs to me now, and is mine to do with as I please. Remember, he is a non-believer. He bears no light. You cannot protect him. Stadia sneered as the wizard backed away and turned to face the boy. Welcome, Jack. I have been expecting you. Welcome back to the Brave Traveler podcast. For fans of the supernatural, tales of fantasy, adventure, and stories of creatures mythological, I'm Dave Murray, your host and the author of Majesty. This is episode 7, and I'm keeping the intro short. Just a word about the theme music. I happened across this on YouTube. It's called Lost Temple, Six Hours of Ancient Cathedral Music. I think it fits perfectly. I'll probably switch it up at some point. If you have any suggestions, let me know. And thanks for listening. Now let's get back to the story. Episode 7 Majesty, the Sorcerer and the Saint Chapter 7 The Angel and the Wizard Gelzuin reached out his hand, and Jack slowly made his way forward, staring in wonder. Wizard's fire, Jack said, as he gazed at the pink light radiating from Gelzuin's hand. A moment later, Jack paused and felt something, a warm and tingly feeling bubbling up inside him. There was no discomfort, only a curious sensation that made him rub his belly, and when it was gone, the wizard called to him. Come, there is much work to be done, and many things for you to see. A slow and eager smile crept over Jack's face as his feet rose off the ground and he became aware of his new found power. Katie, look! I... I can fly, Jack said. Katie watched in stunned amazement as her brother took to the air and went higher and higher until he disappeared among the dark rafters above. He lingered in the shadows, looping around the wooden beams, once, twice, then dove straight down with the confidence of a hawk. Katie watched as he swooped under the old wooden table where she had been seated, then grabbed the canvas cloth and threw it over the tiny fairy who fell to the floor under its weight. Katie ran to uncover her as Jack arced back into the air, laughing and spinning. He did cartwheels against the ceiling, then swooped down once more with the wind whipping through his hair, drew his legs underneath him, and landed with expert skill right in front of the wizard. Jack reached out to steady himself, a little dizzy from his trip around the room. Did you see that? He said to everyone and no one, out of breath, his voice a gasp of wonder. Yes. And there is much more I can teach you, the wizard said, and smiled. With a gift of flight, the boy had instantly become his apprentice, 
and was firmly in his grasp. Gelzuin smirked at the angel, now that he was in total control, then turned and called to everyone in the chamber. Prepare the wagons and spread the word. We leave tonight, the wizard said with a shout, then placed his arm around Jack's shoulder and led the boy away. The two faded into thin air, and the hideous procession of ogres and goblins disappeared behind them. No, come back! This is most unfortunate, the fairy whispered. Katie turned to the angel. Can't you do something? It is the wizard who controls him now, Stadia answered. But, but can't you stop him? Not without risking your brother's life, he said. The tiny fairy shook her head as she flicked back and forth. Most unfortunate indeed. The angel studied Katie with a ponderous gaze. The wizard believes you can find the white horse, the one that is called Majesty. Is that true? No, cried Katie. I don't know anything. I just told him a story and he believed me. I made it all up, really. I don't know anything. The angel stood silently while Brahman and the fairy and a host of dwarfs watched and listened. The wizard has chosen you above all others and has risked a great deal to bring you here. And here you stand, said Kitch. Katie just stared at them through her tears. For the moment, let us assume there is some truth to his claim. Katie looked down in despair. A moment later she felt a hand beneath her chin then gazed up into the eyes of the angel once more. Fear not. You are a child of God, a bearer of light. That is certain. It is a bold adventure which lies ahead. But if you are brave, I believe the opportunity will present itself to save your brother. Katie tried to summon her courage. Will you come with me? she asked. Stadia smiled down. It is God's will. He has sent me to watch over you, and so I shall. Together we will learn what it is you know, and uncover the wizard's plan. Suddenly the fairy leapt in front of them like a spark from a flame. Together! She shouted in her tiny voice. Indeed! Said Bromwyn. Together! The bear's booming voice filled the chamber. The dwarf leader stepped forward to join them, and Katie looked with growing surprise as others gathered around. Dwarf men in leather boots and long capes who drew their little swords and shouted all at once, Together! 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 together, 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 together. together. We will stand with the child of God, if you will have us, said Bromwyn. The bear bowed graciously before Katie, who was speechless, and could only marvel at the entire group gathered before her. Y yes Thank you. All of you. She said finally. Together! 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 Chapter 8 A Dark Departure The beginning of any great adventure was a cause for celebration in the land of Coravandia, and this was no exception. In fact, there was the sense that this was to be the greatest adventure ever undertaken by man or beast king or slave. Torches lit the castle walls and trumpets blared to signal the wizard's departure, while hundreds of onlookers watched the band of brave travelers assembled in the stone courtyard and the preparations being made for the journey. Katie stood next to the bear in the midst of the commotion and stared in wide-eyed wonder at all the strange sights around her. There were three wagons set to make the trip, one for the dwarfs, one for the ogres, and one for the wizard. Just then the fairy Kitch fluttered down, all a-sparkle, and pointed to the largest wagon in the middle of the courtyard. The rabble wagon, forty feet long, as big as a boat, and thirty feet high. A beauty, isn't she? Katie gazed at the wagon with all of its cranks and pulleys, the stairs and railings leading up and down, then peered up at the huge wooden mast that towered above it, reaching into the darkness. The wagon was so huge it had six wheels instead of four. There were two in front, two in back, and two enormous wheels in the middle, twice the size of the rest. 
It does look like a boat. A boat with wheels, Katie said. The Rabble is the best made wagon in all the land, with the finest crew of wagoneers to drive her. I picked them myself, Bromwyn said proudly. Look there. Kitch pointed high up on the wagon. That's Gogarth, the driver and captain, a fine soldier and a good leader. The dwarf stood above all the others, yelling orders to his men, who rushed about to secure their cargo. They moved so quickly Katie could barely keep up with them, but recognized the dwarf with the stylish hat and white plumed feather. I remember him, Katie said and pointed. That is Gimble, a good little dwarf and master builder, the designer of the rabble wagon. Don't let his size fool you, though. He eats like a horse. Just then, a gray-bearded dwarf popped into view, armed with a short sword strapped to his side and a silver hammer in his fist. His armor breastplate was badly dented and looked like it had seen too many wars. That's Binderbeck, the old soldier and blacksmith, said Kitch. But before the old dwarf could move, a black-haired, bushy-bearded dwarf came alongside. He was bigger than all the rest and carried a long spear. That is Grel Tibor. He is a turn dwarf, big and ill-tempered, but turns are good fighters, and Grel is among the best of his kind. Next came a happy little dwarf with rosy cheeks and a beard as white as snow. He looked around quickly and nodded in their direction. Every crew needs a good priest, and Friar Jingles is certainly the best among many. We call him Jingles because his proper name is too long and we take your breath away in the same. Bromwyn waited, and soon another dwarf appeared. And there is Raylan. Katie caught sight of the nimble little dwarf as he slid down the tall mast. Raylan wore a red tracker's cape and a wide-brimmed hat, pulled down low, which made him look mysterious. When he reached the deck, Katie could see that he was indeed smaller than all the rest. Raylan is our tracker, the best in all the land, and a master swordsman. Last of all, there is Rumyan. Bromwyn pointed to a fat little dwarf that was busily polishing a bottle of wine with his sleeve. The dwarf paused briefly to check his reflection in the bottle, then curled the end of his handlebar mustache and returned to his polishing with great care. No crew would be complete without a cook and toastmaster, and Rumyan is always ready with a grand toast for any occasion. With all present and accounted for, Bromwyn nodded proudly. The crew of the rabble wagon, seven stout-hearted dwarves, tried and true. Just behind the rabble was another wagon, considerably smaller, nearly half the size and in terrible disrepair. It creaked and sagged in every direction and looked as though it might fall apart at any moment. What about that one? Katie asked. That one belongs to the ogres, Bromwyn growled. No sooner had he spoken than a piece of the wagon fell off as one of the ogres happened by. The hairy beast picked up the plank, gave the wagon a brief glance, then tossed the wood aside with a grunt. Katie and Bromwyn ducked as the board sailed overhead and the ogre walked off, grumbling to himself. There were nine ogres altogether. The only one Katie recognized was Rogad. He was the tallest of the beasts, while Slag stood beside him with his huge pointed teeth that jutted out at either side of his nose. The other ogres were so fierce and frightening, Katie could hardly bear to look at them. There was one, however, that wore a silly grin and was a constant nuisance to the rest. The ogre had teeth like a picket fence and eyes that couldn't stop dancing. This was Zark, who was indeed an idiot, even by ogre standards. Katie watched as four of the ogres loaded large wooden crates aboard their wagon, while Zark took them off the other side and put them back on the ground again. This went on for quite some time until Zark grew tired and decided to take a break. Four other ogres sat in a huddle playing a game of cards with large dried leaves. They growled as they passed the leaves around and looked at each other suspiciously. Soon they were frowning and peeking at each other's leaves. Since they were all cheating, 
It was only a matter of time before the leaves went flying and a vicious fight broke out. Katie watched in horror as the ogres fought like a pack of ferocious animals, while everyone else ignored the beasts and went about their way in the busy courtyard. The sparkling fairy fluttered just above Katie, then landed on her shoulder and looked around with excitement. Well, what do you think? About what? Katie said, her face aglow in the fairy's light. All this, your new family. Katie looked at the horrible ogres that were snarling and wrestling on the ground in front of them. How anyone could mistake the pile of smelly beasts for her family she didn't know. The fairy pointed. The Wiegans, she shouted. Wiegans? said Katie, still confused. You know, the dwarves. They're chronicle dwarves, mostly very loyal and trustworthy. They will be with you from now on until you reach the white horse, and so will I. The dwarfs struck their flints and one by one lit the lanterns aboard their wagon. The ogres that were wrestling on the ground stopped fighting long enough to take notice, then clambered to their feet and ran off to do the same. As the golden fires blazed brighter, Katie could see the flags that flew above both wagons. The larger wagon flew the flag of the dwarfs, which was ornate and very colorful, while the ogre's flag was nothing more than the tattered remains of an old sack that was hung on a pole and looked as though it had been recently pulled from a bucket of slop, which is precisely where it had come from. The ogres clearly didn't understand what flags were for and were merely copying the dwarfs. Even so, the dirty old rag represented the ogres quite well and was a fitting symbol for them. The third wagon was very different from the first two and smaller still. Strangely, it carried no cargo. It was fancy and looked like a carriage made for royalty black and studded with jewels. A cloth canopy that stretched over the wagon bore the crest of a silver and black dragon, which was a symbol of sorcery and magic. This was the wizard's carriage. Katie hadn't noticed the strange things milling about in the shadows beneath it at first, but now, amidst all the activity in the courtyard, she could see them more clearly in the flickering torchlight. The little figures were smaller than dwarves and even uglier than the ogres. They wore spiky black armor and had skin as green as swamp water. These were war goblins, hand-picked by the wizard and born for battle. It was hard to tell their exact size because they were always hunched over and kept their heads hung low. Katie counted six of the horrible creatures that were busily oiling the wheel axles with buckets of grease, but none of them were as horrible as the seventh goblin which happened to be standing right next to her, sniffing her hair with his long hooked nose. Katie jumped back and Numlock bared his crooked yellow teeth, grinning wildly. Ha! The goblin had been waiting there to frighten her, and now that he had completed the task, Numlock winked with his glowing green eye and scampered off to join the others when the bear caught sight of him. Be gone, you horrible creature, Bromwyn growled then looked down at Katie. Are you all right? Katie nodded and tried to catch her breath. Beware the goblins and mind yourself. We don't want to lose you before we begin, Bromwyn said. Katie smiled politely as the bear looked around them. As you can see, everyone is very excited. Yes, they are. But where are they going? Bromwyn turned with a look of surprise. We are off to find the Majesty, of course, and you are leading the way. Katie stomped her foot and pounded her fist against her leg. But I don't know where he is! What you mean to say is, you don't remember. Katie's face went blank as she stared at the bear and listened. My dear, you are a child of God. There is no other creature in our world as blessed as you. Has no one ever told you? Katie shook her head. God preserve your innocence. <laughs> our Lord gives his children special knowledge. He does? Indeed. The knowledge still lives within you. It hasn't gone. The truth is, what you know, you don't know you know. 
and what you think you don't know, you know indeed. Katie stared at him. Now she was confused. She looked down at the ground, pausing to think, then tilted her head up with a look of doubt. And what about my brother? The bear's face suddenly changed, and he became very serious. Your brother has forgotten everything altogether and is lost. With that, Bronwyn turned and headed for the rabble wagon and made it clear that he did not wish to discuss the boy at all. A stiff wind blew through the stone courtyard, drawing sparks from the torches and bringing a chill to the air. Katie shuddered and drew her robe around her as she looked up at the cold dark sky and the frosty night descended upon them. Here you are. This should help matters. Katie turned to find Gogarth, the red-bearded dwarf standing next to her with a fur cape. He draped it around her shoulders and Katie snuggled inside the warm cloak. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katie said and looked to the sky. It feels like winter. Yes, it never used to be this cold, Gogarth said as Katie drew the fur collar closer around her neck. Did the wizard do this? No, he's not that powerful. The wizard is a curse to us and causes us to suffer, the dwarf said, then looked up at the black clouds gathering in the sky. I believe it is God himself who is trying to drive the evil wretch out of our land. It'll start to snow soon. Happens every night about this time. I pray we can survive another storm. Just then there came a loud noise the sound of chains clinking and banging. A crowd of dwarves pulled back to make way as ogres lumbered forward, dragging great lengths of iron chains across the courtyard. As strong as they were, the beasts labored to load their heavy cargo onto their wagon, all the while puffing steam into the cold night air and kept about their task as it began to snow. Katie watched them with growing concern as the first flakes drifted down and Gogarth helped her with her hood. What are they doing? What are the chains for? Gogarth looked to the ogres, his eyes filled with regret. Those, those are the chains that will bind the white horse. I'm afraid those chains are for majesty. Gogarth lowered his head and walked away, leaving Katie with the snow falling around her. She stared at the horrible creatures with their iron chains that were being piled aboard the ogre wagon, and for the first time, she wished she knew nothing of angels or heaven. Maybe then, in her ignorance, the white horse would be safe. As it was, she feared she would lead the goblins, the ogres, the evil wizard, and all the forces of darkness straight to the white horse, and never forgive herself for what might happen. The little chipmunk had tried to warn her when she first entered the strange world, and now his words were truer than ever. Things were very bad indeed. Katie watched the terrible ogres as the snow fell and sprinkled the ground with a white frost, and just then a familiar little voice spoke to her from somewhere nearby. Unusual weather we're having, as usual, isn't it? Katie looked down. The tiny chipmunk was back and up to his little chipmunk knees in freshly fallen snow. This is not the fine land, you know. Things change here. We get old and it gets cold, he said. The fine land? Katie looked at him blankly. The chipmunk tried again. The place where nothing ever changes, never grows old, he said as if she should recall. Katie just stared. You aren't from around here, are you? He added. I'm sorry, everything is so strange to me. You should have turned back. I told you, he said. Katie stooped down and looked at the tiny animal very closely. He wore gold-rimmed glasses and his funny little mustache collected flakes of snow. A tiny red scarf gathered around his neck warmed him against the cold. Who are you? Katie asked. Just a woodland creature, the chipmunk replied, squinting through his glasses. And you, I presume, are the child of God. I didn't recognize you at first. My eyes aren't what they used to be, you know. Anyway, we've been expecting you 
You have? Katie said with some surprise. Yes, well, when the wizard showed up, we knew God would send someone. We just didn't know who. And here you are, he said, looking up at her smartly. Katie dropped to her knees in the snow, then turned to look at the ogre wagon, loaded down with chains. The chipmunk watched a single tear roll down Katie's cheek. I wish I'd never come here, Katie said. I'd do anything to turn back now. Tis too late for that, dearie, but I'll give you this, the chipmunk said in his squeaky little voice, and motioned for her to come closer. Katie thought it was rather silly, since the chipmunk's voice was too tiny to be heard above all the noise around them. No one even knew he was there. Still, she leant forward. Be encouraged, you hear? The chipmunk said. The evil one is clever, but not very smart. There's a difference, you know. Besides, you have an angel and the wisdom of God to guide you. Katie thought that was rather insightful for a chipmunk, even one who could talk. The little creature turned to walk away, then stopped and added, That's as good a hand as any, I'd say. He nodded, then started off again. Oh, and I'd get some boots if I were you. He yelled back to Katie, and with the snow nearly up to his waist, he ducked under the blanket of frost and disappeared. Katie stood up and looked down at her bunny slippers, which were already covered. Ahem! When Katie turned, she found Gimble standing there beside her. The round little dwarf was wearing his large hat with the long white feather stuck in the brim, and in his hands were a pair of fur-lined boots. For you, child of God, the dwarf said proudly and stooped down. He brushed the snow from Katie's slippers, then helped her slide her feet into the animal hide boots, slippers and all. The boots came all the way up to Katie's knees and wrapped her legs in thick fur. Thank you, Katie said, when there came a shout from the dwarf wagon. Gimble, prepare the harness! Gimble smiled apologetically, doffed his large hat, and bowed. When he did, the long white feather swished in front of Katie's face and tickled her nose. With that, the dwarf ran off to help the others as an eerie silence fell over the crowd in the courtyard. Slowly, every eye turned as something entered through one of the larger gates in the side of the castle and cast its giant shadow across the snowy ground. Katie took a step back as Binderbeck, the old blacksmith, approached the wagons. In one hand he carried his silver hammer, in the other he held a long leather rein like a leash. Attached to the other end of it was the biggest, most gigantic horse Katie had ever seen. The giant stallion pranced like a young colt and stood twelve feet tall, glistening, jet black from head to tail, with hooves as big as barrel heads. A beauty, isn't he? said Bromwyn, as he returned to Katie's side. He's enormous, Katie exclaimed. Yes, he is. His name is Nix, which means a knight, but we call him Juggernaut. I think it fits, don't you? Katie just nodded as the horse settled down and plodded forward with its huge head hung low like a gentle giant. Binderbeck loped along in front of the animal and Katie felt the ground quake beneath her feet as the black stallion drew nearer. With one swipe of his head, the giant horse could have easily flung the old dwarf across the courtyard like a matchstick. Instead, he allowed Binderbeck to lead him until he stood before the rabble wagon. Whoa! the old dwarf said and raised his silver hammer. As soon as the horse was in position, Gimble and the others quickly harnessed the giant stallion to their wagon. When all was in place, Juggernaut raised his head and pawed the flagstones with his mighty hoof. The horse shook his silky black mane against the flurry of snow and seemed to sense it was time. Then came the ogres once again, and the fury they brought with them was an absolute nightmare. There was kicking and biting and growling and snorting as two enormous wild boars 
fought against their captors. It took six of the biggest and strongest ogres to handle the ugly beasts. Each boar was as big as an ox and had long yellow tusks that curled back on either side of its fat snout. Their huge heads were covered with wiry bristles of hair that stuck out like cactus needles, while their pink eyes flitted back and forth as they wrestled against the ogres, bucking and grunting all the while. Two of the ogres grabbed the boars around their necks while the others fought to grab a leg or a tail. Mostly they shoved and punched the giant pigs to keep them moving. One of the ogres made the mistake of grabbing a hind leg and the boar lashed out with a swift kick. It was Zark who went flying with a few of his teeth trailing behind him. When they finally managed to hitch the boars to their wagon, the animals bucked and stomped all the more. They shook the ogre wagon until the chains rattled and wooden crates toppled over the side. Rogad roared and grabbed the reins and pulled with all his might, but the beasts were too strong and it was all the ogre could do to stay aboard. Everyone watched as the boars raged when another light appeared in the sky. The angels slowly descended through the snow. Dwarves and other woodland creatures backed away as he came down and landed next to Katie. By the time he arrived, the boars were in a full rampage. They used their hind legs to punch holes in the ogre wagon, kicking and bucking, splintering planks and cracking boards. Be still, the angel said softly. Katie turned with some surprise, and no sooner had he uttered the words, the wild boars settled into their harness and were tamed by his command. The ogres blinked at each other as Bromwyn stepped forward. Thank goodness you came. Those dim-witted brutes and their terrible beasts would have destroyed everything before long. Patience, dear king. The ogres are the least of our worries. Just then, the wizard emerged from the castle, dressed in his heavy wizard's cloak. What is all this noise? he shouted, with his young apprentice close behind. Jack hurried along, dressed in his own wizard's robe, the wizard's robe he had always dreamt of. It was deep blue with billowing sleeves and studded with diamond gemstones across the chest and shoulders. To add some sparkle, the wizard had said. In Jack's arms was a bundle of maps, rolls and rolls of them, which he fumbled around but managed not to drop as he followed the wizard across the courtyard. Gilzuin proceeded and climbed aboard his black coach. Jack piled the maps into the carriage and Gilzuin helped the boy up. Once Jack was on board, he settled into his seat and leaned back into the soft black velvet cushions that were prepared for him and the wizard. He rubbed his hands along the polished brass rails and admired the comfort of the carriage. That is, until the goblins climbed aboard. Jack cringed at the sight of the ugly creatures clambering up over the sides. His first instinct was to grab something to defend himself, until he remembered that the goblins were with the wizard. He slid back in his seat and tried not to move. The goblins took notice of the boy with their beady little eyes and growled. They could smell his fear, but all it took was one glance from the wizard to silence them. One by one the creatures made their way down into the shadows like obedient dogs and stayed near the floor. Numlock was the last to go. The goblin glared at the boy, but dared not risk a second glance from the wizard and withdrew to take his place with the others. Now that Gelzuin had arrived and the wagons were ready to depart, Kitch darted in front of the angel with her light sparkling. Where will she ride? Kitch asked excitedly, pointing to Katie. Bromwyn stepped forward. I would be honored if the child would ride upon my back, he said. Katie looked at the huge bear with his thick brown fur. Oh, could I? Bromwyn smiled, then turned to the dwarf wagon. Kimbo! The little dwarf came running and stood ready. Fashion me a saddle. The child will ride upon my back. With a nod, the dwarf grabbed his tool sack, then looked around. Laying on the ground just behind them was the plank of wood from the ogre wagon. He picked it up and with a wink went to work. Tools flashed, shards of wood and sawdust flew everywhere, and before Katie knew it, the job was done. It was just like Jack had said. 
The dwarf's amazing speed was matched only by his remarkable skill. Gimbal brought the saddle to the bear, which looked more like a little chair, finely carved and lined with sheepskin. It even had arms and handles for Katie to hold on to. With a few leather straps, Gimbal quickly fashioned a harness. When all was done, the chair fit snugly onto Bromwyn's back, and the bear looked like a fine and fancy ride on a merry-go-round. With the saddle chair in place, Gimbal paused to dust off the seat, and the bear raised his paw. Katie beamed a smile, and with a grand flourish of his hat, the merry little dwarf helped her climb aboard. Katie's boots sank into Bromwyn's fur as she made her way up onto his back, then sat down in the saddle chair and nestled into the fleecy wool lining until she made herself comfortable. It's perfect, she said. Gelzuin had been silent as long as he could, and when Katie was finally aboard, the wizard yelled out, We don't have all day! Proceed! he said, then placed an arm around Jack's shoulder and motioned them on. Bromwyn looked up at Katie. Well to, child. Seated upon the bear's back, with every creature, great and small, peering at her in the snowy castle courtyard, she wished it was all a dream. But it was not, and they were waiting upon her answer. Katie turned to the angel. It was time to lead them to the fabled creature, but with the snow falling all around her, in a world she never knew existed, and no earthly idea of where she was going, there was one thing she was sure of. This was a nightmare, and she was afraid. 